four, three, two, one. We are now live. So, greetings everyone and welcome to Author TV, this combined Bangladesh Spine Society and Mumbai Spine Society webinar. And for further proceedings, I'll hand it over to Dr. Dheeraj, a moderator today. Over to you, Dheeraj. Uh, thank you, Ashok, sir. Uh, uh, thank you for Ortho TV for this, uh, for this wonderful uh, opportunity to, to have a joint session with uh, our neighboring country, Bangladesh Spine Society. Uh, uh, today, uh, uh, we have a wonderful session on cervical spine trauma. The upper cervical spine uh, uh, talks and cases will be taken on the, uh, on the Indian side. Uh, the sub spine cases and talks will be taken from the our uh, uh, colleagues uh, from Bangladesh uh, Spine Society. Uh, I hand over to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Provesh from yeah. Bangladesh uh, to introduce his faculty. Then uh, over to uh, Shivastas are after him. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dhiraj. Thank you for giving me opportunity. Uh, at first of all, may I introduce uh, our the chairpersons of this uh, whole session from our side. At first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Khandagar Abdul Awal Rizvi. He's the respected uh, uh, president of Bangladesh Spine Society. He's also the former president of Bangladesh Orthopedic Society, as well as the uh, former director of NITOL. And next, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Mahmoud Shah Alam. Uh, he's the former head of the Department of uh, Department of Orthopedics Surgery in Dhaka Medical College. Uh, he is the former, he's now the vice president of our society and the former secretary general of Bangladesh Spine Society. And now he's working as a, a chief consultant of Bangladesh Spine and Orthopedic Hospital in Dhaka. Next, I would like to introduce another chairperson of our session, Professor Dr. Syed Shahidul Islam. He is the Honorable Treasurer of our society, and he was the former Secretary General of Bangladesh Orthopedic Society, now working as a senior consultant in AVK Hospital. Next, I would like to uh, introduce our Honorable Panelist from our side. Uh, may I introduce Professor Dr. Mahmoud Anurul Islam. He is the respected uh, Secretary General of our society, and as well as he's working as the professor of spine surgery of Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, the largest uh, public medical university in our country. Uh, may I also introduce uh, Professor Dr. Mahmoud Kamrullah Hassan. He's also working as the professor of uh, spine surgery in uh, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, as well as he's the vice president of our society. May I introduce Professor Dr. Munjurul Haq Akand Chaudhuri. He is the honorable executive member of our society and the former professor of orthopedics of NITO. May I uh, introduce Professor Colonel Dr. Uh, Abdullah Wal Vuya. He is working as the consultant uh, in the high care hospital and is the former uh, professor of orthopedics in uh, combined military hospital medical college. Uh, may I introduce uh, Professor Dr. Mohamed Abdul Rob. He is the Honorable Executive Committee Member of our society, as well as he's the former Professor of Orthopedics of NITOR. And I'd like to also introduce Dr. Mohamed Rajaul Kurim. He's the Joint Secretary of our society, as well as he's the, working as an Associate Professor of Spine Surgery in NITOR. And uh, other speakers uh, will be from our side. Uh, uh, Dr. Sharif Ahmed Junaid, he's the scientific secretary of our society and he will be presenting a case today. And, and my, myself, uh, Dr. Pravas Chandra Shah, uh, 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 with you here as a moderator, as well as I am the office secretary of our society. Then thank you very much. And then uh, next, uh, Dr. Dhiras, please. Uh, thank you, Pravesh. Uh, I, uh, I will uh, hand over this uh, proceedings to uh, Professor uh, Dr. Sudhir Shivastav, sir. Sir is the president yes. of uh, Bombay Spine Society. He is a, a former head of department of the prestigious institute of uh, King Edward uh, Medical College. Uh, sir is a professor, a legend and a master, uh, which you all look up to uh, and love to hear always uh, from him. Over to Shivasto, sir. Shivasto, sir. Please unmute yourself, sir. 
thank you there is a very good evening to all of you i warmly welcome all the faculties and office bearer of uh, bombay uh, uh, spine society and bangladesh spine society better sure now, we cannot see you we cannot see you yeah, yeah i will just open this so it is not a chance that both of us from bss bangladesh spine society and bombay spine society so this togetherness is uh, is extremely visible you know some time back also we had combined meeting and i think this is going to be there uh, in future also uh, we have uh, all the consultant from uh, bombay because all we are a uh, member of bombay spine society i will in introduce uh, what are the people who are going to actively participate though uh, actually it is being uh, seen by all the members of uh, uh, bombay spine society uh, the faculty who are going to talk is dr chirti choudhury is consultant in spine surgery from hinduja hospital dr vishal kundnani from bombay hospital and lilawati hospital then we have uh, manish kothari he is consultant in spine surgeon in jaslok hospital and our own siddharth badwe who was working here in hn hospital uh, in mumbai now shifted to us but uh, he will be there today in evening and there are many other consultant who are going to present the cases like dr tusar rathore he is associate professor in st gs medical college in km hospital he is a spine surgeon and dr amit sharma he is also a spine surgeon from bombay uh, you know spine society he is working in various hospital of uh, bombay and you can imagine his busy schedule so i welcome all of you i welcome all the faculties and participant i welcome all the delegates from bangladesh spine society and bombay spine society i think now i should uh, you know hand over the proceeding to dr dheeraj and dr saha who are going to further take this uh, session uh forward thank you thank yeah. you very much dr uh, thank you dhiraj uh, one yes. one second i'd like to interrupt uh with apology uh, i would like to introduce uh, one of our eminent faculty our honorable vice president of our society dr fazil hawk uh, he will be present uh, one case today uh, he is now working as a senior consultant of orthopedics and spine surgery in square hospital dhaka and then uh, please uh, proceed to the next session yes yes i, I will welcome my uh, bombay spine society secretary dr satyan mehta uh, and we'll like to proceed uh, uh, to our uh, lecture session uh, first first talk is by dr shitish choudhury uh, on decision making in atlanta actual injury so over to dr shitish uh thank you very much uh, dheeraj uh, for inviting me to be part of this uh, meeting uh i'm going to cover upper cervical trauma and as you know how oh, sorry yeah uh, i'll keep my video off because i'm on cellular network uh, i think i lose some bandwidth because of it um my talk is going to be a bit longer than 7 minutes so bear with me i'll take up my question answer time as well uh, it's difficult to cover uh, all the fractures in 7 minutes i'll give a brief outline of all of them so here we go so the craniovertebral junction has a very unique anatomy quite complex but it has very little intrinsic bony stability it provides the greatest range of motion in the spine because it has these complex stabilizing structures and various ligaments uh, that hold the bones together but functionally the craniovertebral junction has conflicting goals these these conflicting goals that is wants to facilitate a lot of motion at this level but at the same time also wants to protect the spinal cord that lies within these bones the ao spine uh, classification uh, divides this uh, craniovertebral junction into three regions and these three regions have their own kinds of fractures so we will see each region individual So the first region is the occipital cervical uh, area. It is uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, there is a box uh, in your screen. Uh, a build order and start and delay. Yeah, which has been uh, yeah on the right side, which has been seen I on the screen. I don't see box. Okay, yeah, I don't see any box. Just unshare and share again. It will go up. Uh, we are we are we are we are seeing we are seeing that box. Okay, I'll sh I have unshared. 
Okay, now can you see any boxes? I don't know. Is this okay? No. No, that box is still there, Chitish. Which box is it? Like, what does it say? So it shows a start and delay. It's a box which we make for a building animation build order. So I think you'll have to quit your keynote again and restart the keynote. Don't uh, disconnect, just uh, restart the keynote. Okay. Let me quit note. So that's the first time it has happened to me. I'm sorry about that. Maybe if I share my desktop rather than the keynote, maybe it will not happen. Let me try yeah, that. You can try that. So that's my desktop. So now. Yeah. Yes, it has gone. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, uh, yeah, let's make up for lost time. So the first region is the occipital cervical area. So the the injury here is the Atlanta occipital dislocation or the AOD, and this is a very rare diagnosis, especially in survivors, because this is such a very high velocity injury with polytrauma and head injury that most of the time this is uh, causes mortality. And it causes extremes of deficit, either death on site because of severe spinal cord injury, or if the patient manages to reach the emergency room, then the patient will have a, like a normal neurology or mild deficits with cranial, cranial nerve palsies. So this is a very dangerous uh, sort of an injury. And uh, this classification you see here, uh, trainerless classification, not very useful because remember that the uh, by the time the patient gets imaged in the emergency room, these uh, dislocations might auto reduce. So you'll rarely find such kind of displacements when you examine these patients in the emergency. Even x-rays as a diagnostic tool uh, or CT scans, if you're using all these powers, ratio, et cetera, uh, they are very in inaccurate. They have very low sensitivity. So the diagnosis essentially is based on measuring the condyle C1 interval or the CCI. And this you measure on the CT scan. Normally, this interval is less than two millimeters and is symmetrical on left and right side. If it is more than four millimeter or if it is asymmetric left to right, then you suspect that this person has an Atlanto occipital dislocation. And this is 100% specific and sensitive. And even though uh, the head is auto reduced, you will find that the joints will appear distracted on CT scan. It's a very uh, accurate measurement. MRIs obviously will show ligament disruption, abnormal signals, subarachnoid hemorrhage around the brainstem. So this is an indirect method of checking it. Obviously, something like this requires a surgical treatment, very careful prone positioning, intraoperative neuromonitoring, fiber optic intubation. Traction cannot be given at all because it will distract the spinal cord and the treatment is occipital cervical fusion. The other fracture in this region is the occipital condylar fractures. And the clinical presentation of this is a classical triad of neck pain, lower cranial nerve palsies because that occipital condyle is very close to the hypoglossal canal and the jugular foramen. And the x-rays essentially many times are normal. Uh, major neurological deficits are uncommon unless you have these type 3 injuries. Type 3 injuries are condylar avulsion fractures and these potentially can be unstable because these condylar avulsion fractures are associated with the first injury that we saw, the AOD. So again, if you ever find an occipital condyle fracture on the CT scan, look for the CCI. If the CCI is more than 4 millimeters or left to right, there is asymmetry. Consider that this could be a more serious injury than just a chip fracture of the occipital condyle. Then coming to the C1 region. C1 region has the common atlas fracture and this is classified this way, either an anterior arch or a posterior arch or the classic Jefferson's which is an anterior and a posterior arch fracture or a type 3 fracture which has a lateral mass fracture associated with it. But more important to remember is that C1 fractures can be associated with C2 fractures such as the dense fracture or the hangman's fracture in about 45% of the time. 
Why is this important? Because the ones that are associated with C2 fractures have a higher chance of neurological injury. As we all know, the classic Jefferson fracture is a burst type fracture where it is a self decompressing fracture. Neurological injuries are rare, but if they are associated with other fractures, then that's a problem. Whenever you have a C1 fracture, you are looking at the integrity of the transverse ligament. And that's where Dickman's classification is useful. The concept behind this is that if you have a mid substance tear of ligament, rather than an avulsion type of a injury of the transverse ligament, the mid substance tears have poor healing potential. And even with immobilization, uh, that's why they require C1, C2 fusion. Diagnosis of transverse ligament injury on the basis of radiographs is quite difficult. One of the means is this rule of spence. And this rule of spence on x rays means you add the displacement of lateral masses on either side, the A plus B. Uh, and if that addition is more than seven millimeters, uh, you can imagine the transverse ligament, which holds both the lateral masses together, is presumed to be disrupted. However, again, this is a very inaccurate measure. It is not very sensitive for the same reason that after injuries, these lateral masses can recoil back into position and give you a false impression that there is no transverse ligament injury. On thin cut CT scans, you might be able to see that avulse transverse ligament tubercle, which indicates that this is a type 2 avulsion type of injury. Or sometimes on high resolution MRI scans, you might be able to detect an intra-substance tear or a mid-substance tear. Uh, so the key rule here for the C1 fractures is to rule out a transverse ligament rupture by all those means that we have discussed. And if you have a mid-substance tear, which is quite difficult to diagnose on these routine imagings, then the treatment is surgery because no amount of immobilization will heal a mid-substance tear of the transverse ligament. And type 2 injuries are bony avulsion injuries. They usually settle down and stabilize with external immobilization, such as a halo or a Miami J collar. However, if you are not able to diagnose, then it is okay to keep suspected type 1 injuries also in external immobilization uh, and wait and watch for two months, three months. And if they have a residual instability, then you can treat them with a fusion. Coming to C2 region, C2 region has two types of fractures. One is the odontoid fracture and the other is the hangman's fracture. Let's see the odontoid first. It's a very common fracture whose incidence increases as the age increases, in fact, is the most common fracture that we will detect in patients uh, above 80. And neurological deficits, again, in this uh, region are not as common. Uh, in this Anderson's classification, as we all know, the level of the fracture, whether it is tip, base, or into the C2 body, uh, determines the treatment. But there is a confusion always between whether something is type 2 or type 3. So Gower came up with this modification where type 3 is defined as a fracture that extends to at least one of the C2 facet. So if you are confused on the sagittal image, whether this is a type 2 or a type 3, look at the coronal image. If the fracture line goes into any of the superior facets of C2, it is a type 3 fracture because the surface area for healing for this kind of a fracture is wide, wide uh, and it's more likely to heal than a fracture that happens exactly at the waist of the odontoid, which is a true type 2 fracture because they have a higher chance of non-union even if you keep them in halo, about 25% chance. And these are all the several risk factors for it. So the way you treat it, type 1 injuries uh, are tip avulsion fractures usually stable unless associated with Atlanta occipital dislocation, they are treated with collar. Type 3, because they have a broad cancellous surface area for fusion, again are treated with external immobilization. Then type 2 are the ones which are a non-union risk and require surgeries. We won't discuss the surgeries as there is a talk later about, about this part of the fracture treatment. Then coming to hangman's fracture, it's actually a misnomer because hangman doesn't get this kind of a fracture. It's actually traumatic spondylolisthesis of axis. And the reason for having fractures in the pars region of the C2 is because you notice the C2 superior facet and the C2 inferior facet are not exactly on top of each other, like how they are in the C3, C4, and C5. So whenever there is a force acting on these facet joints, the weakest part in this area is this pars, which fractures. Again, neurology in this is not as common. 
uh, and the FND classification, the modified FND classification gives a gives us a good picture of how progressively this fracture becomes from mild to worse. So you see, in type one fracture, you have the parse fracture, but you have the disc that is intact. You don't have an injury of the disc. In type two, progressively the disc injury increases from PLL to the disc and reaches the ALL. Type three is the worst kind where you have a parse fracture. You have a completely separation of the odontoid from C3. The disc is completely disrupted and the C2, C3 facet joint is also dislocated. So uh, coming to some variants of uh, hangman's fracture, the important one is the star Eismon variant where you have the fracture line that goes to the posterior aspect of the C2 vertebral body. Now, why this is important? Imagine if this fracture displaces that posterior wall of the C2 vertebral body is going to impinge on the spinal cord. Whereas the usual parse fracture, bilateral parse fracture, if the uh, dislocation happens, then it is a self decompressing fracture. This type of uh, injury is not a self decompressing fracture. This will cause further injury if the displacement occurs. So the risk of neurological injury in this is much higher. So how do we assess this x-rays? Difficult to judge many times because you may have an auto reduction when you are seeing them in the emergency room. It is difficult sometimes to detect type 1 versus type 2 and may require flexion extension x-rays which we rarely do in acute setting. CT scans is useful to understand fracture patterns, especially the atypical patterns of the star Eismon variant. But the most important uh, imaging that is, helps us determine the treatment is the MRI which shows us ligament disruption which shows the disruption of the disc. It also sometimes shows a disruption of the disc enough to cause a herniation of the C2-C3 disc behind the C2 vertebral body. So how do we treat this? If you have a type 1 fracture, disc is intact, only the parse fracture, you treat them with external immobilization. If you have a type 2 fracture where the disc is partially injured, not fully injured, then you can potentially treat them in an external immobilization such as a halo or a Miami J as long as the reduction is maintained. But the reduction is not maintained, you are looking at a fusion. The same goes for type 2A. The only difference here is that the reduction is in compression and the reduction is not in traction as it usually is. The only absolute indication for surgery in hangman's fracture is a type 3 where you have a completely dis disrupted disc and a translated C2-C3. This cannot be treated with conservative methods. If you have a disc herniation behind the C2 vertebral body, uh, then you are going to do an anterior surgery plus or minus posterior surgery. But if you don't have a posterior disc herniation, then you can potentially do a posterior surgery or for that matter, anterior surgery as well. The principle is very similar to a bifacetal dislocation in the subaxial cervical spine. But as you have seen, there are so many classifications in this and there is no real unifying theme in this classification because you know various people have published this classification at different points in time uh, in the history. Uh, but if you look at it broadly, the unifying theme of the injuries at the craniovertebral junction is that ligaments rule. The only exception to this is the type 2 odontoid fracture. What this means is that if you have a clear ligamentous injury, the treatment is usually sur surgical. And the reason for that is no amount of external immobilization is going to heal a clear ligamentous or a disc injury. So you have two groups of patients, one group of patients where there is a clear dis ligament disruption such as atlanta occipital dislocation or a mid-substance tear of the transverse ligament or a C2-C3 disc uh, injury completely like that happens in type 3 hangman's fracture. These patients require surgery. Whereas other fractures which do not have a clear ligament disruption such as occipital condyle fractures, atlas fractures and some C2 fractures except type 2 odontoid fractures potentially can be treated with immobilization. The only exception to the rule here is type 2 odontoid fractures, especially in, in younger population where they have a higher risk of non-union. So this is the algorithm that you can follow without even uh, remembering all the different types of classification. This is the principle that needs to be understood. With that, thank you very much. I'll end my talk. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Shitesh. It was an extensive talk, and you have covered uh, uh, huge, huge information in very uh, simple uh, way. Thanks a lot. Uh, any questions for Shitesh? We can take one question quickly. 
Okay, what we'll do in case of type 2 autoimmune fracture in osteoporotic patients, in case of osteoporosis? So, uh, if so, that's a very good question, and it's a it's a controversial answer, right? So you have you have an elderly patient who is osteoporotic and has a type two uh, odontoid fracture. So here, uh, the the literature is both ways. Whether you are treating them with fixation versus you are treating them conservatively. When I was training, we were uh, we were conserving all most of these fractures about ten years back. But over a period of time, you know, we are finding that these elderly people live long enough uh, that they develop instability and then come uh, with uh, a myelopathy, uh, which is which it does not happen immediately. That's the problem. It's not like young people who are going to go out in the world and you know injure themselves. These are elderly kind of slow activity people uh, who do not immediately dramatically show deterioration. But if you follow these people long enough. a lot of people would uh, have a problem so my choice is not an anterior surgery for an osteoporotic type 2 odontoid fracture is going to be a posterior surgery it's a bit tedious but uh, if you ever want to do a surgery in an elderly patient that is going to last and you are going to take the risk of it i would do a posterior dr kitish dr kitish may yes. i ask you one question yes in uh, ao type 1c that is a uh, occipital uh, cervical joint complex separation or displacement okay in that situation hot surgery you prefer for that a o d right atlanta yes. occipital dislocation yes atlanta occipital okay. dislocation and it is that a o type on c um it's so basically atlanta occipital dislocation is a all or all or none kind of an injury okay all or none kind of an injury either you have a dislocation or you don't so if you see the occipital condyle joints occipital c1 joints that are distracted and if you see the ligaments that are dis distracted there then this area is quite a dangerous area to do conservative treatment so this is going to be an occipital cervical fusion obviously because the injury is occipital cervical so the the surgery is going to be occipital cervical fusion How many extent do you want to be fused in cervical region from occiput in that situation? Uh, in that situation, I would, I would go to if at that depends on the the kind of fixation I get. But if I am going to get a transarticular screw, I'll stop at transarticular screw. That means a transarticular screw going from C two into C one and then connecting it to the occiput. If not, then I might go say C two pedicle screw, and then maybe another one C three. But uh, but if I'm if I'm getting a par screw in C two, then I'll go par screw C two, par screw uh, lateral mass screw C three, lateral mass screw C four. See, par screw is very weak. So if you are getting a C two pedicle screw or a C two transarticular screw, then I'm happy to stop at C two. But if I'm not, then I'll go down. Go down to C three. C two C C three C four, whatever it takes. C two. Whether C three C three or C four. C three C four is the uh, lateral mass screw or uh, pedicle. Yeah, you can if you if you want to put pedicle screw, then you don't have to go so down. So if you can put C three pedicle screw, then you can stop at C three itself. Pedicle screws are very strong. If you are putting lateral mass screws, then you will have to get many purchases. So is if there, you cannot is, put a pedicle screw, then you have to. Is there any option for translaminar screw in that situation in C three C four translaminar screw? i wouldn't use translaminar screw in this situation the reason for it is unless you are able to connect the translaminar screw to the other screws so atlanto occipital dislocation cannot just be held with just translaminar screws that would not be a very good fixation you need more points of fixation so if you are using translaminar screws then you will have to somehow connect them to c3 lateral mass screws and c c4 lateral mass screws and the tulips yeah. are very far apart you know getting that in line you can get it in line if you want to but it's like a troublesome thing you have to use extensions you have to use a uh, extension uh, cross links to get that in in line you can do it though oh, so it is we have to we are yeah. short of time we have to yes. move on so we i will request other faculties to uh, uh, to ask question in the discussion box in the chat box uh, 
Provesh, we can continue with the next talk. Yeah, yes. Now, uh, thank you. Now, I would like to request uh, Professor Dr. Muhammad Shah Alam from Bangladesh. Uh, he will be speaking on subaxial cervical spine injury management strategy. Sir, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Provesh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can hear okay. you. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody, especially the organizers uh, and uh, moderator and the chairpersons uh, from Bangladesh uh, Spine Society as well as uh, Mumbai Spine Society and also the senior faculties uh, from uh, India and also Bangladesh. So I'm going to talk on subaxial cervical spine injury management status. Can you can you network see? problem? I think, sir. Uh, you cannot hear me. Uh, you, your screen is not still shared. Yeah, it's not. We can see. Okay. That's, yes, sir. Yes, we can. Can you see? Can yes, you see my sir. slide. Yes, play play the screen. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. So cervical spine means that starting from cervical three to cervical seven, and uh, and uh, the uh, about the st stability of the spine, especially in the cervical spine, there are many many I mean the multiple theoretical models, but finally it is considered the most acceptable model is the three column model of the tennis that is anterior, medial, and the posterior column. And the current standard assessment uh, is usually done by spinal cord injury by Asia grading that was started in 1997 and devised in 2011. And cervical spine becomes unstable mostly the trauma, maybe the other causes that degeneration, hydrated disc, infection, malignancy, and congenital. But in traumatic cases, there are 20% spinal injury occurs in multiple levels. And for diagnosis, the history is most important than clinical examination and investigations. And the about investigations, very conventional is the radiology. Uh, yes, uh, your screen has been uh, lost, sir. You again share your screen, sir. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can yes, hear you, sir. Okay. Yeah, but you cannot see your screen. Okay. First thing, it, uh, is, I'm sorry for technical problem all of a sudden. But, uh, Is there to down? So, is there anyone beside you to help you, sir? Yeah, yeah. Just coming. Can you see it now? Yes, yes coming, coming. It's coming. Yes, come. yes. yes. Go, to, uh, go to the screen. Uh, so, regarding the uh, clinical examination, investigation, and history, very conventional. Can you see it now, Shahid? Go to go to slideshow. Go to slideshow, please. Go to slideshow. It, it is in show. The slideshow I have shared. Okay. Again, again, you lost. Sir, sometimes slideshow yes. makes some problems, sir. I think. Can you see it no. now? No, 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 sir. Yes, coming. Coming. Not visualized, right? It's coming and going. Something problem. I think it is better to not be. Not, not, not to go slide and show. Sir, I think uh, you can avoid slideshow. That will be better. Sir, so uh, should I? We ask our next presenter. 
Uh, no, no, just, just give me a time. It is better that. Just to go after his presentation, there's some other response. Sir, oh, sir. Yes, yes. You just exit and again entrance. You can share it. Share it. Share it. Share it. Share it. Share it. Share Sorry for interruption. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's coming up. Yeah. You know, look at the video. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You uh, you better uh, keep in this way, sir. Don't go for slides, sir. Yeah, okay. yeah. You can present the same this, sir. Right. Okay. So the radiology is conventional as the three views: the AP, lateral, and the open mouth view. Along with sometimes the if it is subluxated or uh, dislocated, then it is automatically reduced. In that case, it cannot be seen in the normal conventional AP and lateral view. Then you go for the dynamic view, flexion and extension view. And also for the lower cervical, we advise for swimmers view as well. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, the other option is the CT scan and CT angiogram. The CT can show the especially the fracture, dislocation, or bony configuration. And the CT angiogram, when it is dislocated of the facet joint and when it is a uh, vessels are compromised, in that case, the CT angiogram is very nice to see the all structure. And, uh, and conventionally, when the uh, disc ligamentous injury or cord or neural components are compromised, then the MRI is the answer. And the uh, MRI, we can get the clue for where is the, so, I mean, the disc ligamentous and uh, neural tissue are compromised. So the classification, there are a lot of classifications of cervical spine fracture, but uh, among them, the Allen and Ferguson classification that is based on mechanism of injury and the position of the knee during injury, that is well accepted and it, it can uh, give the clue for further planning of the treatment. So flexion and compression and particle compression, flexion and destruction, uh, and also, uh, I mean, the extension and compression, extension and destruction and lateral flexion. And among this, there is also, when it comes to the treatment protocol, so the principle of demetrial treatment, first of all, patients should be resuscitated according to the ATLS protocol. And the principle is to realign the spine, stabilize the spine, and the preserve and prevent the further neurological damage and rehabilitate the patient in his previous position. So the specific management of unstable cervical spine, the decompression of the neural structure, restoration of vertebral integrity, selection of proper approaches and the implants, and avoid and manage the if any complications. So there are some strong indications, especially in the urgent surgical stabilization, when unstable fracture with progressive neurological deficit and unstable fracture with multiple injuries. Though it is controversial, but one group of people, they think that it should be done earlier. So subaxial cervical spine injury at KO classification at the stick and consider on the fracture of morphology, the discal ligament as complex and the disruption and the neurological function. And on the basis of this, there are some scoring system. And on that scoring, uh, when the, if it is less than three, then straight away we treat the patient Conservatively, when it is a four, then equivocal, maybe conservative or surgical, that is depending on the patient choice and the surgeon choice. And if it is more than four, definitely it is a strongly indicated for surgical intervention. So the management strategy as in subaxial cervical spine injury based on type A, type B, and type C. So when compression injury that is type A, disruption either anterior posterior tension band and types both anterior posterior along with translatory instability. Further, we also evaluated some parameters like facet joint injury, neurological injury, and also other comorbidities associated with. 
So the A time, I'm not going in details that A1, A, A0, A1, A2, A3, A4, that is five subtypes in the type A injury. And B type is the three subtypes and the B1, B2, and B3. And C, I mean the A1, A2, A and B, along with the uh, a translatory or a rotationary instability we consider. So I'm not going into this, but when we'll go for surgical intervention, when A0, A1, A2, straight away, we can treat it conservatively. But surgical intervention, sometimes A3, one group of people considered can be treated, but patient needs to follow up closely. But A4 and type B and C type injury must be treated surgically. And most injuries can be treated with anterior cervical plate and screws. So the surgical approaches may be anterior, posterior, and sometimes combined. That is uh, global uh, uh, stabilization. So when go for the anterior or posterior, there are two groups. When the unstable spine, but it is reduced, in that case, uh, case we can consider whether the anterior neural compression is present or not. If there is no anterior neural compression, then we can assess the posterior disruption. If there is no disruption of the posterior structure, then we go for stabilized by anterior approach. But when the posterior disruption is present, then we'll go for posterior approach. Again, when the anterior neural compression, yes, it is compressed or damaged, then there is the options. The posterior disruption, if it is no, then we go for anterior, same as before. But if it is yes, then we'll go for anterior approach, along with complementary restoration of tension band structure. But when the unstable spine, but it is displaced, not reduced, in that case, reduction should be done either hello or by any skeletal traction. And if there's no reduction, then, but neural anterior compression is present or not, if no, then anterior approach and complementary restoration of tension band for reconstruction of anterior column. But if the neural, I mean anterior neural structure is compressed and will go for anterior approach, decompression and reduction is done. And if the reduction is not possible and posterior approach, and reduction and stabilization by anterior and fusion by internal fusion. But when the reduction is possible, in that case, the anterior fusion and internal position die. But there are many ways to stabilize the anterior destruction implants like interbody start grafts, implants, bone graft cases, and it's going to play reconstruction. And say for an example that this patient is the C3, C4, B type injury. And this patient initially was treated conservatively by putting traction. Patient had no neurological deficit. You can see the third HCA lateral is well reduced, and patient was discharged. And this patient subsequently came to us with kyphotic deformity and compression of the spinal cord. You can see the radiology, you can see MRI and CT scan. So there's a posture structure is totally lost, but patient having the neurological deficit. So this way you can treat them the global. Uh, I mean, the stabilization, but in our perspective, what we do, I did this patient the anterior surgery, that is anterior decompression by discectomy and stabilized by start graft and further enhances by anterior cervical plate and screw. And you can compare the P and post operative X. And this patient, you can see the I mean, subsequently patient again is a neurology, so I cannot show the video because I cannot share the slide. So next, and patient having with a good fusion and with a good neurological function and without any problem. This is patient that two months old fracture dislocation for an example, cervical six over seven with HIA grade C. That patient was treated because of two months, it was tried to reduce by skeletal traction, but not reduced. Then we go for uh, decompression by anterior CCF is done and stabilized by bone, I mean the cylinder cases with bone graft and also anterior cervical plate and screw. It means that we did the me one level. Another patient, the two level, you can see the subluxation in the cervical four and five, cervical five and six, and HL grading was C. So unstable span, we have pushed mostly the anterior. Anterior surgery was done by 
doing the standalone cases, the two levels. This is a power of IT video, uh, the picture, the two level standalone case. The next, this is the post operative x ray and the first is the pre operative x ray. Subsequently, this patient having the good diffusion along with a good neurological function, and patient can uh, move far, uh, I mean, the all limbs and also the reasonable range of the uh, cervical spine movement. So this is uh, after uh, six months. So when uh, there are some cases, uh, this patient having with a uh, fractured dislocation and with neurological deficit, and patient had also the ankylosing spondylitis, and patient also the fractured in the proximal tibia. This patient was uh, treated for the uh, I mean the immobilization and followed by surgery, both anterior and posterior. Anteriorly first done, and uh, then second setting was done. Anteriorly we did uh, the uh, ACDA by surgery great school and start graph. And also the global, uh, I mean, the stabilization, one level above and one level below the posteriorly uh, by uh, lateral muscle stabilization. And in this patient, uh, subsequently regained his neurology as well as the stabilized spine three months after a patient can work with a little bit of support. So I like to say that there are some complications in anterior surgery and nerve root injury, recurrent length and nerve injury. Mostly there's a dysphagia after doing the ACDA. And sometimes the, I mean, the spinal cord injury, there is less than one in general. It should be there for person. It is not uh, common in all the time, but sometimes it can happen. And instrumentation failure, including the non union. I like to say that the, the, the take home is that instrumentation is subaxial, unstable cervical spine injury. The anterior, cervical, anterior surgery is mostly satisfactory, and we are doing it. And but posterior, the fixed supporting deformities are an absolute contraindication to uh, to the posterior approach. And posterior decompression without fixation is primarily indicated for lordotic and possibly the straight spine. And supplemental posterior stabilization is required when more than two level uh, instability is there. And lateral mass fixation is a simple and easy pr procedure, but not provide the with stronger stability. Medical screws provide very strong constant in severe cervical instability, and 360 degree stabilization by three column fixation would be, poss uh, be possible if we could overcome the risk factors. Thank you for your patient care. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Mohammed Shah, sir. It was an excellent elaborative talk. Any questions for Professor? Sir? We can take quick question. Okay, so we can proceed to our uh, next speaker. So you can answer in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Vishal Kundani, uh, he will be presenting on management of odontoid fractures and dilemma in management. Dr. Vishal Kundani is a known figure and he is a senior spine consultant in Bombay Hospital. Very good evening, everyone. And uh, on behalf of Bombay Spine Society, I take this honor and privilege to welcome all my colleagues from Bangladesh Spine Society. And I look forward to, to being a part of this academic program in far more intrusive manner. Uh, welcome you all and thank you again, Bombay Spine Society, for having us around here to have a shared program on, on cervical spine trauma. So odontoid fractures, like the Shetij mentioned, is one of the most commonest kind of injury that happens in the craniovertebral junction. And this is also one of the fracture that has always been a dilemma to manage whenever it comes to plan of management of these fractures. Before we proceed, I think these are the eight lines that will come up in the next seven minutes. That it's one of the commonly missed injury, also misdiagnosed injury. Not only misdiagnosed, but also mismanaged injury. The classification systems, though, are described, but are not really very useful with very objective criteria of management. And that is why subjective factors do come into play with various options available. And all of them are right in their own way. Anterior osteosynthesis still remains the gold standard. Unfortunately, the contraindications of anterior fixation are only evolving with each case. And that is why all these factors have to be taken into consideration, leading to more and more patients being managed by posterior fixation. And remember that fracture morphology is the key in surgical decision making. And it is it cannot be based solely on the type of fracture that one has, but also various factors have to be taken into consideration while you plan the management for odontoid fractures. Uh, this is just one case scenario where a young guy underwent a polytrauma and the primary attention went on to an injury which was far more grotesque 
patient had a blunt trauma abdomen and was managed for that unfortunately till two weeks around patient continued having neck pain and this is what was done at two weeks showing that this fracture uh, odontoid fracture was diagnosed in this patient and this patient was lucky that the fracture still remained to be undisplaced which was managed conservatively but this shows how uh, odontoid fracture or any craniovertebral junction injury which usually doesn't present with neurological deficit can easily go missed and misdiagnosed or get neglected for a very long period of time resulting into neglected or delayed diagnosis further creating problems and this becomes even more commoner in pediatric age group because of the laxity of ligaments patients generally tend to have only neck pain or mild torticollis as the presenting symptom and that is why a very very high index of suspicion is a, a, a key to diagnosis of these uh, problems so that you do not miss upon any of these fractures and remember odontoid fractures in kids is far more common than what we think so the message number one if you really want to pick them early have an extremely high index of suspicion and there is a neck trauma protocol that in every obtundated unconscious patient always do a cervical spine screening x-rays for trauma fractures in the craniovertebral junction and even in conscious patients if there is an injury with symptoms of neck pain please don't forget to screen them even if the pain is as mild as a mild neck pain in these patients now whenever we see fractures of odontoid we always tend to have a dilemma how do we manage them and what type of fracture this is is there a objective way to find out what type of fracture this is whether it is stable or not and whether it requires treatment in the form of surgery or not the answer to this is very clear yes shitesh did mention about the classification of anderson and alonzo which does mention that there are three type of fractures based on the location of the fracture whether it is on the tip or the waist or the body of the odontoid saying that type 2 fractures are the most commonest ones and also these are the most notorious ones to manage both in young population and elderly population because these are the ones which tend to have a tendency of going to non union however the natural history still is very uncertain you cannot say that all type 2s will go into non union because many of them will go undiagnosed and will be seen only fused at a later date so the natural history is uncertain and despite having good classification systems we still do not have management based on purely stability or displacement which is not mentioned in anderson olenzo's classification system and again the management of whether anterior or posterior which is the way to go still remains unclear based on these classification systems moreover the downsides of these classifications become bigger when there is a inter observer variation like in this particular fracture where the fracture line goes from the odontoid body all the way into the waist and into the body of the c2 so some may say it's a type 2 some may manage it as a type 3 and this kind of inter observer variation is not uncommon to see resulting into further confusion and dilemmas in management of these fractures to complete the classification and to bring in some more objectivity to it brewers came up with a further classification adding some more points that while planning management not only the type of fracture the location of the fracture has to be taken into consideration but also presence and absence of osteoporosis displacement of the proximal fragment and of course presence and absence of comminution angle of fracture line and associated injury should be taken into consideration when you plan a management of odontoid fracture and all these have not only played a role to decide whether this fracture is stable but also to decide what kind of treatment is feasible and suitable for a particular kind of patient for example in a elderly patients with undisplaced fracture these fractures will just unite by them so you really don't have to go and stabilize them at the same time in an elderly patient with a comminuted fracture no amount of treatment by anterior posterior is going to help so these guidelines have gradually been laid down of course there is no clear clear cut black and white objectivity to it but these are the factors which one must take into consideration while planning a particular kind of treatment for these patients and the current recommendation is that undisplaced fractures be it in elderly even in elderly with mild displacement of up to grade 1 you should try to treat them in conservative with strict immobilization in halo waist or even a hard cervical collar which can give you as good as 60% fusion if not bony union but fibrous union does happen which also is a acceptable consensus remember i repeat a fibrous union in elderly is a acceptable consensus of treatment and to achieve that target is not a bad idea which can easily be done by a hard cervical collar or a halo waist in more than 60% of the patients so again surgery is not the primary rule in type 2 fractures in elderly patients however when it's a displaced fracture surgery is the mandate and you have to stabilize them because these are the patients who will not only lead to a progressive myelopathy but also can have catastrophic neurological deficits in a later date and that's why stabilization and surgery is the key in displaced uh, odontoid fractures and also in very young type 2 fractures even when they are undisplaced surgery is recommended so the carry on message non surgical for undisplaced fractures 
non surgical for even displaced type 2 fractures and heart cervical collapse ago and all displaced fractures and all fractures in young patients type 2 should be managed surgically now the biggest dilemma should i do anterior which is the gold standard and saves the c1c2 joint or should i do a posterior surgery which though it takes away the c1c2 by fusing it but it is far more safer better in a predictable kind of treatment option we all know that anterior osteosynthesis is a gold standard it spares c1c2 joint fusion rates are very high it's technically a simple and cost effective procedure but we all must understand that though uh, this is just one example how anterior osteosynthesis putting in a screw in a odontoid fracture mildly displaced in a young guy was done and this is another example where we have been doing navigation guided odontoid fractures in patients with type 2 odontoid fractures even if they are undisplaced in the young patient we would do a anterior uh, fixation in these patients but we also must understand that though anterior uh, surgery is a gold standard but failing anterior fixation is not uncommon there are far many more often number of cases where anterior surgeries have failed and these surgeries have not failed because the technique is faulty but it is purely based on one thing that the patient selection was faulty you did a good anterior surgery in a poorly selected patient a nicely done anterior surgery will not survive the biomechanics of a poorly selected patient and this poor selection of patient is not based on the type of patient but the type of fracture that you chose so there are certain type of fractures which are not amenable to anterior fixation and now there are guidelines based on various uh, subjective criteria is not objective but there are criteria laid down where they you can easily predict that your anterior surgery is bound to fail so what are those these are the contraindications which have been mentioned whenever there is a transverse ligament fracture transverse ligament injury or delayed non unions or irreducible ones anterior is not to way to go comminuted fractures osteoporotic fractures again anterior is not a way to go and now uh, i for the first time propose uh, a term called favorable anatomy versus unfavorable anatomy based on the feasibility and possibility of anterior surgery versus posterior surgery favorable anatomy is where the fracture line is either transverse or oblique where lag screw principal compression can be obtained so these are the only two type of fracture morphologies where anterior surgery will work other than this all other kind of fractures are unfavorable anatomies for example a reverse oblique fracture you put in an anterior lag screw it will displace and fail very soon any comminuted proximal fracture any small proximal fragment you will not be able to get a hold of the threads of screw elderly patients pediatric patients neglected non union patient and of course a typical variant where there is a fracture going all the way down into the body or in the uh, in the pars again these are the fractures which will bound to fail by doing anterior fixation so the carry home message in all these fractures the only thing that works is posterior surgery either a segmental c1c2 or a transarticular screw some case examples reverse oblique fracture anterior surgery was done failed we went in and did a posterior surgery transarticular in these patients another patient transverse lr ligament chip fracture you do a anterior surgery it's a recipe for failure we went in did a transarticular through posteriorly another patient less than 6 mm of proximal fragment you do a anterior surgery you will not be able to get a hold of the proximal fragment we did a posterior surgery in such patient and wonderful fusion established another patient comminuted fracture with a lateral displacement any amount of anterior fixation is only going to fail we did a navigation guided surgery transarticular and you can see the fusion mass in the posterior aspect a typical variants where the fracture line goes to the pars this is very often mixed that if you are seeing a fracture of odontoid you have to evaluate whether the pars is intact or not because if you do anterior fixation like was done in this patient it will just walk out in no matter of time resulting into failure of anterior fixation bringing defame to the technique which is actually a poor patient selection rather than poor faulty technique here and of course osteoporosis is a serious contraindication you must avoid putting in an anterior screw in patients with osteoporosis or with hyperextension injury and posterior displacement anterior screws are bound to fail in such patients so posterior surgery is the mainstay in such patients to summarize odontoid fractures the classification is simple however natural history is not there are multiple factors in management unfortunately most classification systems have not comprehensively taken all these into into planning but we as clinicians need to take all these factors into consideration to decide whether there is a favorable anatomy and feasibility of anterior screw is possible or there is unfavorable anatomy with variables present requiring a posterior surgery in most elderly patients hello west immobilization with fibrous union is a acceptable standard and surgery is a mainstay in displaced fractures thank you so much dr vishal uh, dr vishal thank you sir for your excellent presentation uh, i think uh, Vishal, I am yes, Professor. Sir. I have one question. Hi, Professor Mohammed. 
Okay, thank you for your nice presentation. But I have a question that in case okay. of bank spawn and dish, in that situation, what do you look like? Whether anterior surgery for fixation or fusion or posterior surgery or transarticular any approach? So it's a very interesting question, Professor. Thank you so much for bringing this up. Uh, remember, in dish and ang spawned, the type of fracture is not a flexion related injury. It is a hyperextension injury. Again, in a hyperextension, posterior displacement fracture, it is a showing anterior. Biggest challenge we, in. Vishal, Vishal your voice is breaking. Can you say again, please? Uh, yeah. I'll put my video off. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, please. Can you? yes. Yeah. So, yes, please so, repeat. So, angspond and dish are two completely, you know, challenging situations where, on one hand, hyperextension injury is the mechanism of injury to create odontoid fractures, where anterior surgery is strictly contraindicated, but the posterior surgery is also not often feasible because of cervical thoracic kyphosis in such patients. So, if you are planning a posterior surgery in such patients. The feasibility of transarticular screw also has to be ascertained because very often you will not be able to get the trajectory of transarticular screw safely in such patients. That is why either segmental C1, C2 fixation will help or you may have to do an OC fusion in such patient. Having said that, we also must remember that the moment you do a posterior surgery in such patients, the chances of a hyperextension injury further going into extension, preventing your complete reduction may also pose a challenge to you. So, which again is a contraindication for transarticular screw. So, these are the things that one must take into consideration when you are choosing a type of surgery in dish and ang spawn patient. So, in that situation, is it better to be fixed with C0 to C3, 4 even? Is it better? No, sir. No, not at all. Not at all. There is absolutely no need to go down in C3, 4. You can easily stop. At C2, you can but if you are not able to get a transarticular trajectory, I think a segmental C1, C2 fixation should be more than enough. You don't have to extend your implantation down to 3 and 4. Not for odontoid fracture purely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vishal. You can please stay with us and answer uh, in the chat box so any questions if uh, arises. Uh, yeah, uh, Provesh, you can uh, call over the next speaker. Okay, so so I will call uh, uh, our next speaker, uh, uh, Doctor Fazlul Haq. So, sir, will be uh, speaking on subaxial cervical spine trauma evaluation and surgical decision making. Over to you, sir. Uh, Dr. Fazlul? Fazlul, yeah. sir, are you yes, I'm, I'm, with us? I'm going to share my uh, screen. Oh, okay, sir. Can I see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Uh, so, uh, my topic is. Sir, uh, please uh, place slideshow if possible. It's okay? Yes, sir, perfect. Good, okay, thank you. Uh, within these seven minutes, I have to present my topic is subaxial cervical trauma evaluation and mainly that surgical decision making. So these two parts I will discuss about the evaluation and surgical decision making is a process uh, I have to discuss. My previous speaker, Professor Shalom, already discussed this uh, strategy <laughs> of cervical injury, sub, uh, subaxial cervical injury management. Uh, I'm showing why the decision making is so important. As you see, this is one of the case example. This is a bust fracture, and the tension band uh, injury is indeterminate. It is, if we classify it as a silic score three and the AO classification two. The question arising that regarding treatment, especially whether what should we do? Another situation, you see the complete neurological deficit, C5, C6, fracture dislocation with locked facet. So uh, what would be the approach? These are these things is coming very frequently in our mind, in our day-to-day -day practice. That's why 
we are very much concerned about the surgical decision making of our patients. So before uh, going to all these things, this, this subaxial cervical spine trauma is one two third of the cervical injury. And uh, as you know, that C, C3 to C7 is the subaxial area. And about 50% of this injury is happening between C5 to C7. But this injury is a potentially catastrophic, is associated with tetraplasia or and severe permanent disability. So it's a definitive evidence-based diagnosis and treatment planning is, is a crucial issue. Before going to the decision-making, I have to few words about this diagnosis. The diagnosis in every trauma cases after the hemodynamic stability, stability, we have to screen the subaxial area and we have to go through the physical, thorough physical examination. Other than this, the modalities is really, really necessary is CT scan is the most commonest modality in the complex subaxial cervical spinal injury. You see, it is about 100% specificity and sensitivity. The conventional X-ray, the sensitivity is very low, is about 70%, but in the simpler type of trauma is we always use the X-ray, plain X-ray. MRI, it, is, it gives the, is recommended in the unexplained neurological deficit and exclude the discoligamentous complex injury. As some of the severe, highly complex injury, we, we do the CT angiogram to, to detect the vertebral artery injury. The classification, the classification is very important because we need a common language for the agreements between the physicians and at the same time, the severity of the injury and the guide, the prognosis and guideline. There are a lot of um, different type of classifications uh, from 1949 to till now, but very commonly using the Alice Ferguson's and subaxial uh, cervical spinal injury, that silix classification and the AO spine subaxial spine classification. But even though no one, however, has demonstrated the superiority or the broad acceptance. Um, as you see, the silix is using very commonly with this score, as uh, previous speaker already mentioned, the more than five is surgery and three and less is the conservative, but its confusion still is in the four. So I'm going to the AO classification, a little bit different in AO classification, the same as the in injury morphology, the compression injury is the type A. When there is a disruption of tension band, either anterior or posterior, that is the B type of injury. And C type of injury is both the tension band is injured and it is translated. Other than this, facet joint plays a, a very important determinant to the posterior stability of the spinal column. So the facet joint and especially the facet joint anatomy and the capsule is very important issue. At the same time, other comorbidities. But even though it is a little bit elaborate and give the good picture of morphology, tension band injury, facet joint, neurology, comorbidities, but even it is uh, very, it's not very user friendly. Uh, there are certain recommendations of the different societies like uh, World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, the spine committee recommending subaxial uh, injury classification system is the safe, effective and guiding the treatment of spinal injury. There is a good agreement rate in the CELIX score. CELIX is easy for the surgeons and residents to day-to-day -to -day use as well. The 
AOA spine classification gives a detailed picture. It gives little bit case identification. Before the planning of surgery, the surgical strategy. What is the surgical strategy? Our surgical strategy is the identification of surgical cases, timing of surgery, to reduction of dislocation and facets, and the surgical approach. The confusion and the decision making is very, very crucial regarding these are the issues. So I will only discuss these three or four points uh, before uh, for the uh, helping of decision making. As you see, the recent publications, the 2020 is a, a spinal cord journal that is time is, is spine. That means the early decompression is, is routine and it gives the uh, evidence of efficacy. It is an international recommendation as a treatment option. So other, this is a review article. It is also in uh, Global Spinal Spine Journal is 2017. The review, this systemic review, the given the opinion like that, this journal in general, the existing evidence supported improved neurological recovery amongst cervical spinal injury patients undergoing surgery 24 hours post-injury. So the early surgery is recommended and this is a treatment option. The secondly is coming to the facet dislocation and reduction. It is a, also a, a good literature. Its, its conclusion is that the subaxial dis, uh, dislocations of the cervical spine can be reduced using uh, Gartner uh, using traction successfully stabilized with anterior surgery and all. If close reduction fails, anterior open reduction is successful in the majority of the cases. The facet cervical facet dislocation when is MRI is indicated. There are a lot of confusion is coming in this regard. The latest uh, article says that um, the, the close reduction in an awake and alert patient may be saved without obtaining a pre-reduction MRI. Some of other studies have indicated that the close reduction in sedated patient may be safe in most instances. So uh, I, I, we can clearly, we are not uh, waiting for the MRI if the patient is uh, alert and awake. Other, other, another uh, really is a controversy issues regarding the surgical process. This is another uh, article it depends on the based on the Celix classification, the systemic literature review, the consensus of experts and the patient preferences. The, the, the literature and the expert consensus, they mentioned that the bust and compression injuries and distraction injuries are more likely to be treated with single injury approach. Translation or rotation injuries may be May, uh, may more commonly be approached posturally with, or with combined anterior posterior surgery. Um, there are other recommendations from the German Spine Society. The most, the recommendation is the most injuries can be treated in the anterior plate stabilization and interbody supports. In certain cases, the additive or pure posterior instrumentation needed, usually lateral mass screw is enough. Other issues is coming, the anterior alone surgical treatment for subaxial spine facet dislocation. This is a systemic, as a review article. This review article also giving the support, the efficacy and success of anterior reduction, fusion, and instrumentation for cervical passage dislocation, so only the anterior approach. It is a safe and more uh, neurological standpoint. Review are not 
due to concurrent facet fracture is low. Certain patient may require posterior based surgery in a specific cases, combined anterior posterior procedure may be needed. So the, finally, the decision making, it depends uh, with the, which type of classification you just evaluating this patient. Like if we follow the Silix classification, for injuries with Silix score is less than three, non-surgical with a rigid color for six to 12 weeks, have more than four surgeries recommended. Interior surgery is recommended for significant Most injuries can be treated with Interior posterior surgery should be considered for patients who require multi-level carpectomy or for patients with severe dislocation or complex injury. Other, if you follow the AO classification, the AO classification for cervical cervical spinal injuries is recommended like that. The AO, A1 and A2 injuries are treated conservatively, but have to be monitored for progressive kyphosis. A3 injuries are applied in the majority of cases, but A4, uh, B and C type injuries are treated surgically. Most injuries can be treated with interpretive stabilization and interbody support. In certain cases, the posterior instrumentation is needed. Usually, the lateral mass screw is enough. Finally, the decision making, finally, to make a decision, we should take into account all factors, such as the individual patients, the surgeon, and the hospital circumstances. Before making a decision, we have to finally consider all these factors. And then the decision making for surgery will be enough and that would help for the final decision for surgical. Thank you, thank you for question sharing. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, any questions for the sir? Okay, so that was a wonderful talk, sir. So you can wait with us and uh, we'll move ahead with our uh, next uh, case discussion se uh, session. So first case will be presented by uh, Dr. Amit Sharma. He's a senior spine surgeon in uh, Saifi Hospital and Prince Ali Khan Hospital. Over to Dr. Amit Sharma. Thank you, Dinaj. Uh, uh, Sorry, one second. At the outset, I would like to thank you, thanks, um, thank uh, Dr. Shivastav and Dr. Dhiraj Sonamane and Bangladesh Spine Society for involving me in this uh, education. Um, what I'll be doing that I'll be uh, showing a video of uh, C1, C2 uh, fixation. Uh, there are various ways to fix the C1-C2 and as Vishal said that uh, one of his common method of fixing the C1-C2 is by uh, transarticle screw. However, for uh, uh, I over the period of time, I uh, developed a liking for uh, C1 uh, lateral mass and C2 particle screw fixation uh, and I most of the time will use this fixation method. So, we'll just go through one video. Uh, uh, can, can we, uh, can uh, the... Admin, allow me to share my screen, please. Auto TV, are... can you please allow? So we are we are seeing the uh, screen of uh, Professor Fazlul. Sir, uh, Doctor Fazlul, you can uh, please uh, share out. Uh... Yes, sir. Doctor Amit, you can try sharing. Yes. So. Um, Basically, over a trans article screw, the advantages I feel of this uh, method is that uh, uh, you don't have to worry too much about the vertebral artery anatomy. Secondly, putting a trans article screw and getting that right trajectory can sometimes be tedious. And if it's a dislocated spine, 
the C1 is significantly sublux over C2, then it will be difficult to insert a, a trans article screw compared to that. Uh, and so one of the prerequisites of putting a trans article screw is that significant reduction should have been achieved before, before you fix C1 and C2. However, with this uh, segmental fixation, you uh, uh, um, bypass all these problems. So uh, with a standard midline incision, we uh, uh, expose C1 and C2. Uh, you do not have to take a very big incision for this procedure because we will be entering the C1 and C2 bang on uh, from posterior. Uh, we don't need any uh, particular angulation to pass any of the screw. I prefer to use a cautery rather than a blunt dissection to prevent uh, significant bleeding happening during the surgery. Um, the muscles and the fascia are cut with the cautery in the midline and then they are dissected laterally. Uh, the C2 lamina need to be exposed all the way lateral to the lateral border of the uh, facet joint of the C2. For the C1 tubercle, we uh, first we feel it with the finger and then you can go safely about a centimeter to centimeter and a half laterally. But it is recommended not to go beyond that, especially with the with the cautery because uh, your vertebral artery might be there and then you might accidentally injure it. If you need to uh, dissect beyond 1.5 centimeter from the midline at C2, then it is advisable to use the blunt dissection. So that's the even uh, posterior arch we are uh, exposing on the left side. Any uh, tissue uh, bridges uh, which are coming in between can be at the same time dissected off. Uh, one of the biggest problem which we feel uh, during this surgery is that heavy bleeding we encounter from the C1, C2 joint. This obviously is an edited video, so we will not be seeing much of bleeding, but um, that's, that's the only problem which we face with this surgery. That when, once you start exposing the C1, C2 uh, uh, joint area then and the C2 nerve root, then you will have a lot of uh, bleeding. And you need to expose that area to uh, insert your C1 uh, lateral mass screw. So after the dissection on the left side, we are proceeding with the dissection on the right side. <coughs> It, um, it might be prudent to uh, be careful while dissecting that you don't go too deep. Uh, you also need to prevent any injury to the C23 facet joint because uh, that will unnecessarily uh, disturb that joint. You need to go all the way later on the C2 uh, uh, facet joint so that uh, you will be able to identify your right entry point because you need to see the facet. Uh, the full boundary of the facet to decide your midpoint for the C2 pedicle screw entering. Um, once your exposure is done, the next step is to uh, go and find out uh, where your C C1 uh, lateral mass entry point is. Many of these steps you can do with the blunt dissection also, but as I mentioned that I prefer to uh, do a sharp dissection to prevent any bleeding while, while dissection. So the only bleeding which we'll be encountering will be at the time of uh, exposure of the C1 lateral mass. You have to study your uh, uh, bony and uh, uh, vascular anatomy in detail beforehand so you don't inadvertently injure any of the vascular structure. <coughs> So once you are uh, done with the exposure, we proceed with the exposure of the uh, uh, C1 lateral mass. Now, one other th important thing is that uh, uh, when you enter this C1, C2 uh, facet uh, joint area, it's uh, better to uh, uh, either pack or do a bipolar all the uh, epidural, uh, all the vessels over there, the venous channels, so that uh, the bleeding will be minimized. So as I said that we have to cauterize our uh, 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 all the venous uh, 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 tissues over there and then you have seen that uh, the dura was seen over there so you just need to stay lateral to that. 
you can either pack with the cottonoid or you can inject uh, you can insert the gel foam in that area so i'll just a uh, little f make it faster now with the with the help of blunt dissection so either you can cut the c2 nerve root or you can you can preserve it also uh, so but if there is any difficulty you encounter while uh, uh, reaching the c2 sorry c1 lateral mass then you can as well uh, uh, resect of the c2 uh, 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 root and it should not create any issue so sometime you have to resect of the inferiorly uh, inferior overhang of the posterior arch of the c1 so that you can have an end on view of the uh, c1 lateral mass you make your hole and after making the hole so this case uh, basically i just uh, i would like to see, show this so this case was operated by me about a month ago before this uh, surgery was done and uh, uh, this case had a odontoid fracture so i had put an odontoid uh, screw however within a month patient had another trauma and then that screw had become loose and the patient came with the severe pain in the cervical area so that's why that's when I decided that rather than going in and revising the odontoid screw, I'll just fix the patient from behind. So once you make the entry point, you will see that uh, uh, that your direction is correct on the on the uh, uh, CM, and uh, your 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 target for uh, anterior uh, uh, border of the C1. So even if you go bicortical, there is no harm in that because uh, there are no very sig uh, significant uh, uh, like vascular or any other important structure in that area. So here we have confirmed that our drill is going in the correct direction. So once we are done with that, then uh, we proceed with the regular tapping and uh, screw insertion. So the direction is, so uh, proximal distal direction we decide on the CM, but the medial lateral direction to, uh, we have to decide uh, in drop and then I usually tend to go about uh, 5 degree medially from the midpoint of the lateral mass. So why, to put the C2 pedicle screw, I check for the pedicle here uh, just at the C1, C2 junction. I will check for the middle border of the C2 uh, uh, pedicle. I will choose the midpoint of the lateral mass of the C2 uh, 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 lateral mass. Uh, and from here, again, in terms of the proximal distal uh, direction, I will check it on the CM, like uh, as shown over here. And once I am confirmed about that, then I will proceed with my uh, further tap and uh, screw insertion. The medial lateral direction will be decided uh, by checking for the middle border of the C2 pedicle uh, intraoperatively. So after that, you uh, proceed with the same uh, steps on the other side. Uh, so once the other side of the C1 uh, lateral mass is exposed, again with the blunt dissection, as I said, this is a, an edited video. You, uh, we encounter a lot of bleeding over here, which you have to just pack with a cottonoid or uh, gel foam or uh, surgery cell. So here we are able to see the uh, C1 lateral mass nicely, and the midpoint of this will be chosen for entry point. Again, we'll check the proximal distal ang uh, angulation, and uh, about five degree middly, the screw will be inserted. Uh, as we saw on the left side, similarly the C2 pedicle screw also will be inserted uh, on the right side by choosing the midpoint of the lateral mass as entry point and deciding the proximal distal angle on the CM and medial lateral angle on the uh, uh, intraoperatively by uh, feeling the middle border of the uh, C2 pedicle. And this is the end of the... Uh, uh, so here, that's the beauty of this procedure. So yeah. you don't, you don't have to uh, have the reduction preoperatively. Once you pass the screws, and on the rod you can do the reduction. So you like unlike yes. a transarticular screw, you can just go ahead with and. Uh, um, Thank you. Yeah, and after that you have to uh, obviously uh, do the fusion procedure. Yes. Um, excellent demonstration uh, video. Just end my talk over here. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Amit. Uh, it was an excellent uh, demonstration. Uh, is it a microscopic picture?
Yeah, so so yeah, it, it, this surgery was done under the microscope. Just for basically, I wanted to record this surgery. That's why it was done under the microscope. Yes, yes, perfect, perfect. Uh, any questions for Dr. Amit? Dr. Amit, so, Amit uh, can you elaborate uh, uh, the technique or entry point of C2 pedicle? For so all our uh, delegates, yeah. So basically, so for to put any screw, we need two things. Number one, the, basically three things. Number one is the entry point. Number two is uh, proximal distal or supra inferior direction, and number three is the medial lateral direction. Right. So my entry point is the is the midpoint of the lateral mass of the of the C2, which I will define. You know, like once I have exposed uh, the C2 lateral mass and the lamina entirely. So that's my entry point. The the supra inferior direction will be always decided on the CM. Means uh, for that I never take CMs. The medial lateral direction I will decide. So so where, so, where, so where you will direct on CM on superior uh, angle? So as we as we just saw over here, you know, like in this uh, CM picture, uh, that's how. Uh, means I'll be I'll be I'll be targeting for this uh, antibody of the CM in the direction of the pedicle. Okay. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah, Doctor Siddharth, you wanted to ask something. Yeah, Amit, excellent, uh, excellent talk and uh, great video. Uh, it's good to see you doing this surgery. Thank you. Uh, uh, in very uh, arthritic patients, where the pedic, uh, where the C one C two is very collapsed, how do you uh, try to get your C one screw? Because uh, there's hardly any space and. Uh, so. Yes, in those kind of situation, what I do, I resect off the uh, the C2 nerve root. So my the the lateral mass is uh, like uh, seen little better compared to what we saw in this video because in this particular video the C2 nerve root was not resected off. Uh, so that's one thing. Second thing, I'll put a uh, uh, kind of puka or some uh, spacer kind of thing. Inside the C1 C2 joint, so that will bring the C2 C1 little. Uh, it will jack up the C1, so that will bring the lateral mass even uh, more clearer in the picture. So these are the two things I do separately. If I feel that there is significant uh, subluxation or uh, there is significant collapse of C1 over C2. Doctor Omit. Doctor Omit. Yes, please. In all time, you follow the CRM guide. Serum guidance, or whether any theoretical or um, uh, our anatomical structure in consideration with your surgery before surgery, have you any planning uh, for introducing this screw after seeing the X-ray or uh, CT scan? So CT angio is a must. We means uh, though in this particular surgery, the the vertebral artery is not coming uh, in the picture as it would in a transarticular screw. But still, CT angio is done for all of the cases, and uh, because sometimes the the vertebral artery might have anomalous connections, even on the arch of the C1, and we would not want to encounter those. So, um, uh, so but yeah, we will have a look at the CT scan. I will not be doing any measurements and those kind of things on the on the pre-op CT. I'll be just be looking at the C2 pedicle whether it's of sufficient uh, caliber to accommodate a screw. Most of my screws are 3.5 mm uh, screws in the C1 lateral mass, and sometimes I put partially threaded screw. Only the tip part is threaded; the uh, the proximal part towards the tulip is smooth. And the C2 pedicle screw will be always 4 mm screws. Yeah, I never had any issue with the with this combination. For C1 screw, uh, lateral mass screw, have you followed the Abumis technique, like posterior arch of the uh, C1 arch of uh, overhang over the lateral mass? You remove that part of bones and then you put the screws. Uh, no, I, I actually haven't done that. I haven't done that. Yes. Thank you for your uh, time. Thank you, Doctor Amit. Yeah, yeah, it was an excellent yes, talk. Uh, you can move out. Yes. Hello. Uh, can we move to the next speaker now? Yes, yes, yes. Please, Pravesh, uh, uh, you can call over the next speaker. Yeah. Uh, now I'd like to request Doctor Sharif Ahmed Junaid. Uh, he will be presenting a case. Doctor Junaid, please. So thank you, Dr. Prabhash, for inviting me. It's a definitely a great honor for me to be present here. As, as we know that already most of the part is discussed by my Professor Dr. Mohammed M. D. Shahalom, as well as uh, Professor Dr. Fosdul Hok. They have nicely discussed the subaxial uh, cervical spine. They mainly discuss the topic that is uh, relevant to trauma, just like my fracture dislocation or bus fracture was like that. 
So today I will present a different case. I think that will be uh, a good case for us. So before we go start the case, this is a case of 65 years male uh, having history of road traffic accident. Typically it's a rare end injury. Uh, so it occurs um, when he was uh, traveling through a rickshaw and a bus truck just from behind. And just after uh, that trauma, patient uh, become uh, uh, unconscious, uh, according to the heart, his treatment, and he cannot remember the incident. And he was then treated in a, a local district hospital. Uh, and they found him with a, a quadriplasia with involvement of bowel and bladder incontinence. But fortunately, his consciousness is regained and GCS is, seems to be almost normal. So according to the ATLS protocol, he was managed there. As the patient is quadriplasic and patient has bowel and bladder incontinence, and you know the district hospital has not so much equipped with uh, cervical spine trauma, there's so a patient was referred to other uh, to our institution. Uh, it was 15 days after injury. And the X-ray that I'm sh showing here, that was the initial X-ray. The important things is that whenever a cervical spine X-ray is taken, it is sometimes seems that uh, it is, you, you have to obtain at least three view. Suppose in AP, lateral, as well as open bowel views. Yeah. But unfortunately, most of the cases, if the quality is not good, so, so that you cannot get enough information for that. And uh, this happens in the that case. So as it is not conclusive, so we have to go to CT. And if you carefully look at the CT, this is the sagittal as well as the coronal plane. There is nothing contributory. Only there is a, some sorts of OPLL, but that is very less significant amount that is C5, C6 level. And in the axial section, it is not, not contributing anything. But things is that patient has quadriplasic, uh, but both the X-ray as well as CT is not conclusive. So as we uh, know that this is patient has neurological deficit, but radiology is normal. So what could it be? So as we know that uh, spinal cord injury without radiological abnormality, is a, it is more common in children, but even then it is also predominant as well as in adult patient. And according to the literature evidence, it is suggested that it may happen nine to 14% in a pre-existing patient who has a degenerative change with spinal canine stenosis. So this may happen. So based on this scenario, as CT normal, X-ray normal, but patient has neurological deficit. So what will you do? Different, what was the MRI? Yes. We do the MRI. And it is as the patient comes to our institute at 15 days after the injury, but patient neurology is still one quadriplegic. Only he, he has some pain, pain prick sensation is present. All motor is almost really upset. And you can see here, there is a compression at the level of C5, C6, as well as C6, 7. And the important things is that there is also a compression in C3, C4, and there is also hematomyelia, ascending hematomyelia. Pro probably this may contributing the neurological deficit. So based on this scenario, what could be the possible diagnosis? Can anyone from the faculties? I think it's a central cord uh, syndrome in a already spondylomy uh, spondylitic uh, spine. But if it is a central cord syndrome, and it may be, but central cord syndrome, as you know that it is most likely the uh, lower limb is recovered. Uh, uh, then upper limb, but patient uh, at this uh, at this moment we got this patient at 15 days after injury, but patient neurology is almost same. 
So it may be a central cord or central cord like syndrome. So, so this is probably just like hyperextension injury that is in the sitting of pre-existing degenerative cervical spine with interspinal bleeding. That means the ascending hematomyelia. So based on this scenario, what will you do in this scenario? Dr. Bishal, are you there or Dr. Shudhir? What is, what is your option in that particular case? Yeah, actually such type of injury are replaced injury. And that is the reason if you don't find anything in the plain X-ray or CT, the yes. MRI is important to see about the any soft tissue ligamentous injury. Okay. Yes. So there may be soft tissue injury and replace injury. It happens. So there is a concussion of the spinal cord and yes. the rest of the radiology looks normal, but you can see even the signal changes in the cord. There is a significant yes. signal changes in the cord and the upper one just opposite the C4 vertebra, you yes. can see a hyperdense shadow, yes. circular hyperdense shadow. So yes. that has uh, led to the concussion of the cord and leading to such a significant neurological deficit. So whiplash injury is known to happen even in pediatric age group. You know, there is a trauma to the cord, but you will not find any signs uh, radiologically as far as the plane uh, X-ray or CT is. Uh, and that's the reason the MRI is extremely important. Moreover, if there is a neurological deficit, you are going to screen the uh, spinal cord otherwise also. So MRI is important in such situation. So these are usually the whiplash injury. Professor Srivastu, is there any yeah. sun, sun structure dislocation of C5-6? Because there is a disperturbation and compressing the cord. And without the dynamic MRI, you cannot say whether the posterior ligamentous complex is injured or not. In that yeah, situation... Yeah, so actually this is not, uh, I would say, chance fracture. It is actually discal injury. During that whiplash thing, the uh, injury of the disc has happened and you can see there is a protrusion in that area. Okay, so this is all the different component of trauma which the patient has uh, suffered. So what so, has uh, led or... to the significant deficit is the, you can see the significant signal changes in the cord. Yes. 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 Or, sir, or it can be already a stenotic uh, uh, cord uh, and in which there was no CSS sleeve and, a, uh, and a, 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 even a trivial fall can cause a deficit in such cases. Dr. Jonah, why do you call this? Why yeah, do you yeah. call this a hematomyelia? Which one? Uh, I mean, the uh, just opposite the C4. Yeah. This is a 15 day old MRI. So, hematomyelia. Uh, this is a 15 day old bleeding. So the signal changes in a hematomyelia will be far different than what is seen here. So to call it a hematomyelia, you will also need to show me, uh, show us the uh, T1 images and possibly contrast also. This is most yeah. likely ascending cord edema, most yeah. likely rather yeah. than uh, hematomyelia. Myelia. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Yes, as yes. well as there may be the hydromyelia as well because there is a Yes. Dr. Srivastu, please. I think. Uh, yes. See, please. Hydro, hydromyelia is different. You know, no, you are no, talking no. about the feelings. That is a different thing, and that doesn't happen so early. Actually, that is a late presentation. So, here we, we are discussing the cord concussion. Yes. Like a whiplash injury, it is a clear cut trauma, direct trauma to the cord. There is nothing like a hematoma inside. Okay, that, so I that, think uh, this is a clear cut injury of uh, the spinal cord because that of means, the that means it is the interspinal bleeding, right? Interspinal. It, it now may be here, as uh, Doctor Manish mentioned, that you require to have a contrast and all. Here you can see what the disc has is coming out and causing compression at the lower level at this level. Yeah. So that is at I would say it is five and six because five and six is also mobile area. And uh, you can, as mentioned by Dr. Dheeras, that there is a slightly uh, slight changes, degenerative changes in the column. So that uh, might contribute to the amount of trauma there. But patient has shoulder, uh, almost the shoulder as well as elbow flexion, as well as wrist flexion. That is also grossly diminished. I mean that there is no motor movement at all. So that, so is, that is the reason I'm telling. You can see the signal changes from yes, C3 yes, downward. Yes. C3 okay. downward. 
So based on this scenario, what is your option? So are you operate this patient or are you treat this patient conservatively? Anyone? See, in, in such situation, first thing you, I, what, uh, can, do you remember what will be the pulse rate of this patient? Because usually patients who are having bradycardia, they have a very poor prognosis. So pulse rate below 50, even if you operate, there are going to be problems. These patients, they don't survive. Okay, if there is a significant bradycardia. So the literature tells that these patients are having, going to have poor prognosis and they die of respiratory paralysis. Okay, so, so I, for I the have... sake of decompression, you can do. But uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, the surgery is, uh, is a question here. Yes, because as it is a 15 days post-dated injury, patient is quadriplegic. So although patient is stable, but in that case, if you operate, what is the chances of recovery or I mean the neurological improvement in that particular cases? Can we give any idea? No, see, in cervical spine injury, you operate for two regions. You operate for stability to the column. Okay, that is one. Yes. If there's a grossly unstable column. And second is for the root recovery. Mm. Yes. Root recovery makes a big deal. The patient who are, who is having significant neurological deficit, even with a good recovery of the root, one great power, he is able to you know manage his motorized wheelchair. Okay. So you you operate in cervical spine for instability and root recovery, not the cord recovery. Yes. So in that patient, I think spine is not unstable, right? Do you think it is unstable? Uh, in this patient, we don't think so. Uh, okay. you, one can take the dynamic view as mentioned by yes. uh, one of the faculty that, uh, you know, dynamic view can give some but, idea. But, but, but in that particular patient, dynamic doing a dynamic view, it is too risky because it will further, it may even further aggravate the injury as well. as. No, no, so, already here. No, so one. Oh, no, Dr. Dr. Junaid. Yes. No, no, not the dynamic. So one thing. Dynamic MRI. Dynamic MRI. MRI. But, yes. but, no, I don't. I, I, I don't think. I don't think we we need a dynamic MRI. If you even look at the stir images, that should be able to give you a fair information about uh, the ligamentous complex uh, disruption. And this does not look uh, like an unstable spine. It looks more like a whiplash injury, as Srivastava sir has rightly said. And there's a fair amount of edema at multiple levels uh, and uh, perhaps there is there is perhaps some bleeding and scarring inside the cord. Uh, so I think uh, instability is not a major concern here. It is a very stenotic spine with a whiplash injury which is the major major uh, issue. So whether you go for uh, conservative management or surgical is there any surgical option? So before, before going to ask is there anybody from the faculty who will operate this patient? Yes, so so uh, since the since the prognosis is guarded, uh, so as per the literature, he is having less than grade three power, so the prognosis is guarded. Still, I will like to give him a chance of uh, recovery. Uh, so I will like to, and uh, since there is uh, some component of compression C three level and to uh, use this down, I will like to go postal and decompress with the laminectomy. So only a laminectomy uh, with, uh, with instrumentation or with, without 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 uh, i think it's a stable spine on table if i feel uh, it's unstable then i can consider the fixation okay, okay. yeah I, I would agree with dheeraj because uh, yeah. this seems to be more like a compressive uh, issue and uh, if he is stable and he's not showing any signs of diaphragmatic paralysis or some of some of those concerns then it may be safe to operate, but it will be a guarded problem. So, so, uh, I will actually warn it is not only the MRI or CT. You must see the general condition of the patient. If he is already having, you know, bradycardia, his respiratory, you can exam on examination, you can see what is the status of intercostal muscles. Yes, sir. I agree, sir. Yeah. Yes. Patient goes he has no bradycardia at all. Yes, sir. he is stable he is as per quite, the information. Sir. He is quite stable, quite stable also. So, in that particular case, operation, 
I will be in favor of conservative treatment in that situation. Because as there is no posterior compression, why you go for laminectomy to decompress this cord? Is there any need to be decompressed from posterior side? But there is a compression from anterior as well. As so, so yeah, I, I agree with Dr. Diras as he already told that if if I decompress, there is all there is, of course, theoretically at least there is a chances of recovery at, at least. So in that particular patient, as it is stable, so what I actually did, so I did this patient no, no, from no. all from posterior side, and I did a decompression from C2, C3 to C7. And I put the pedicle C2 and C7 pedicle screw and C3 to C6 lateral mass screw. And fortunately, this patient is under follow up uh, of four months. And his lower limb uh, recovery is now, his power is two, two by five. And he is improving. And I also the upper limb, he, he is improving also, but lower limb relatively better. So this is, a, I think, a very interesting case. Uh, this can be patient managed as well as conservatively maybe, but as I did operation and patient is improving, even this can also be improved by conservative as well as. But as Dr. Srivast already mentioned, if the patient is stable or you have to very carefully assess the patient, you have to look the patient every case individually. And of course, decision is of course based on the case to case, and one thing I have to mention that though this type of patient, although it is radiologically, I mean the X-ray CT may be normal, but if you carefully evaluate the MRI as well as carefully evaluate whether there is a soft disc or hard disc, is there any OPLL or like that? And based on this scenario, we can judge. And according to the judgment, you right decision can be made. So is there any comments from the faculty? Yeah, Dr. Sharif, uh, this is a nicely done uh, case, uh, but uh, I want to ask you, if, when you opened this patient posteriorly, did you find uh, that there was any uh, in, uh, ligament injury uh, or, you know, anything that you were uh, worried about? Actually, I do, when, when I opened this, I, to me, it seems that at the level of C5 and C6 level, it seems that there is an injury. And what actually I found that there is also the buckling of the ligamentum flammum as well as. So in that case, if you saw that C5-6 is uh, maybe unstable and maybe the disc injury is also at the same level, uh, didn't you consider maybe doing only a localized fusion rather than a long C2 to C7 stabilization? Of course, you were the surgeon at that time, you thought whatever was best, but this is just uh, thinking in retrospect, would that have been useful? You are absolutely right, because, um, but problem is that the, the, the hospital where I am right now working, there is a very limited facility of doing the laminoplasty because we have no su such much tool to do the, uh, this uh, laminoplasty for uh, this patient. And I think that if I do a cervical laminectomy, that may cause an iatrogenic instability as well as. That's why I put the instrumentation. And, and to me, it, it seems to be easier as, as you know, that lateral mass screw as well as the C2, C7 pedicle screw is very much saved to the patient. Thank you. Sharif. Yes. Faculty asking you whether you go for the long segment. Because that can be five and C6 uh, fixation and fusion from the posterior. If you carefully look at the MRI, there is a compression at the C3, C4 level as well as. Can you see? No, no compression. Uh, just look at this. Look at this. I think his compression is only at the C5, oh, no. C6 and it is from the front anterior side. You just carefully this slide. There yes. is the compression, C3, C4, and there is also, I mean, the cord signal change at the C4. And C3, C4 level, there is a compression. You can see here. Here is the compression. Yes, and patient has also the shoulder as well as elbow is flexion is weak. So I think if it is only C5, C6 or C6, C7, that might be the only the finger flexion will be hampered or like that. Yes, he has also the shoulder function is impaired. So for, that's why I took decision to go for much higher. Dr. Jana had one question. The lordosis in the MRI versus the lordosis in the post-op X-ray is different. 
so did you, because you were using a long segment instrumentation you had that opportunity of giving a good lordosis to allow the chord to fall back nicely yes, so yes. You, have you thought about it yes 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 this was actually mane uh, in in i mean that in pre operative lordosis was good better rather than in post operative i totally agree with you okay uh, we have to move ahead uh, dr pravesh yeah we are running Please sort of proceed. already i think uh, we should uh, go for the next speaker i think thank so, you thank you for thank you dr junaid for please be with us yeah yeah uh, i am i would like to next uh, request dr uh, tushar rathor uh, to present his case dr rathor please dr tushar is a associate professor in km hospital an excellent uh, deformity and atlanto actual uh, spine surgeon having uh, uh, great work there so is my presentation visible now yes yes to sir uh, so uh, i am essentially uh, going to discuss uh, one of the fracture which was kind of atypical and it's not been discussed till now so uh, this was a case uh, uh, where a elderly patient presented to us almost after 10 days of fall he was 58 year old and he presented uh, uh, with a severe pain in the neck throbbing headache and tingling numbness which was present in all the four extremities there was a brief history of loss of consciousness at the time of fall so we had done a ct scan which showed a, a, a no a kind of a intracranial injury if you see carefully uh, his odontoid along with his atlas has completely displaced uh, behind his uh, c2 vertebral body so this patient tried to take a initially a conservative management at his home when he painkillers couldn't work for him he presented almost 10 days after a, a episode of injury again you can see on a ap view you can appreciate a lateral mass so that indicates the amount of uh, the the rotation as well as the uh, extension component of the injury and you can see the c1 lateral mass on either side on the ap view as well on a ct scan which we do routinely in this kind of a cases you can appreciate that there is a not only a fracture between the uh, c2 odontoid type 2 fracture but it's posterior displaced and there is a considerable overlap between the c2 body and the c2 odontoid patient had a hyperreflexia typical picture of pyelopathy with a weakness in the shoulder and a bilateral side you can see on this 3d ct view uh, where you can appreciate that the c2 facets are completely laid bare because of posterior translation of atlas along with the odontoid another interesting thing is this odontoid is maintaining a constant relationship with the atlas these are again the 3d ct view uh, on either side which showed a complete uh, uh, uncovering of the c2 facets and a translation of the c1 and odontoid when you see mri again you can see this odontoid fragment is completely sitting in the spinal canal there's a corresponding compression of the spinal cord along the level of odontoid there is also corresponding signal changes uh, uh, which can be seen and appreciated in the substance of spinal cord this uh, image is kind of a misrepresenting because they are usually it always take cut horizontal the cut should have been in this plane and then would have appreciated the amount of compression of the spinal cord uh, since the patient had a throbbing headache this kind of injury are associated with a vascular uh, uh, injury so we did a ct scan and we showed a interesting finding if you can observe the the left sided vertebral artery is pretty dominant and it is uh, can be appreciated on the posterior side whereas the right side vertebral artery is a rudimentary uh, it's completely thinned out and if you can see uh, the angiogram the left side vertebral artery is pretty well seen but right side is not seen this is taken from the posterior so there's a left right uh, correspondence uh, along the image so uh, we had a issue so we had a case where there's a right side vertebral artery which is completely rudimentary and the left side artery which is completely intact so uh, the dilemma here uh, was whether the to go from anterior posterior combine what kind of a reduction maneuver one can do for this case and most important the literature is pretty clear about this posterior displaced odontoid fracture which are rare that they are associated with a, a, a respiratory arrest if you give it too much uh, traction because these are highly inherently unstable injury and if you give a, a, a excessive traction this may have a effect on the brain stem and lower brain stem centers and a lot of patients have gone a respiratory arrest and there's a corresponding literature which i showed at the end so at this stage uh, uh, i would like to uh, take the opinion of the uh, 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 faculty uh, how would they approach for this case 
ट्रैक्शन It has to be done anteriorly because it has displaced posteriorly. So what has happened? The fractured part of the dense along with the C1 arch and skull it has gone behind. So when you put tongs in the skull, you give bit gentle traction and try to flex it, and it will it should fall because this is a fresh injury. Uh, I think the days you told Dr. Tushar how many days? Sir, at ten days, sir. Ten days, but it will come. It should come. There should not be any problem. And since you are monitoring the patient, you are reducing it. Uh, you know, with the awake patient, there should not be problem. And uh, you know, similar thing also, it is done. You know, the lower down, like uh, you know, bifacial dislocation. Patient is awake, and you reduce it. I think it will be easier to reduce in this case rather than the you know unifacial dislocation because this should fall in the place. and uh, regarding fixation i think once it falls into the place you have to see the trajectory for you know dense screw whether you are able to pass that screw in that trajectory and then it will be uh, you know uh, as a simple procedure i think one should be able to do it there are different options obviously one can do posterior fixation also but i think uh, uh, i think that will that should be my plan uh shivastu sir uh, uh, i agree with uh, what you said completely only one thing with the flexion what you mentioned it is the uh, proximal part of the, the uh, broken dens the distal uh, dens it's already poking the cord so if it's flexion it shouldn't further uh, press the cord and cause some uh, injury there so is it no. extension or a neutral traction is better no initially you give straight traction then you flex it okay okay now there we know the steel root of three see so big dense is lying in the canal and patient doesn't have much of the deficit just tingling numbness so here the space is very copious there is no problem and actually i could not see what is the status of the pedicle of c2 okay if yeah. there is or lamina then you have a bigger space So can you just uh, guide us, uh, Doctor no, Tushar? Uh, it is intact, sir. It is intact. The pedicles are intact on either side. So, so, so I think, I think uh, the plan should be same. You should give straight traction and then flex it, and I think you should fall in place. Uh, uh, for the opacity of the time, I would say that Shrivastu sir has. Uh, uh, yes, Manish, you want to say anything? As uh, sir said, as uh, Shrivastu sir said, this is a highly unstable injury. so reduction also will be relatively easier than a facet dislocation only your yeah. vector as sir said is going to be uh, important yeah yeah so so as highlighted the the lit, uh, the most of the time we have to do a close reduction uh, and it has to be awake as rightly sir said but again it has to be very titrating because it's highly unstable and you get a neurological deterioration which also dheeraj expressed the concern so so the, the the there are only few sporadic case report about this kind of fracture pattern they have always said not more than 15 kg or 16 of body weight because they can suddenly go a respiratory arrest i will show you the articles about this fracture also so uh, we tried to do a close reduction attempt in this case a patient was a 10 day old we tried to do a weak reduction the we could not get any reduction in spite of doing all the maneuver traction we also applied a gardevel tongs slightly anterior to give a flexion vector after a neutral traction but unfortunately we could not so we uh, we 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 decided to go for all posterior approach for this case after a failed oh. attempt reduction which is the uh, routine standard one should do for this case so essentially this odontoid fracture fragment was moving with the c1 lateral mass or the c1 body or a c1 vertebral oh. body so we took a purchase in the c1 lateral mass we gave a traction to correct this overlap we attach a rod to the c1 tulip which could have given some amount of leverage and another important point which i mentioned to you in a vertebral artery angiogram since the right sided vertebral artery was completely rudimentary i expose the c1 c2 interspace i cut the c2 ganglion on that side and i, I approach the c2 facet between the c1 c2 i pass my pain field and i try to reduce the vital lever off you can't go medially because you you can't control the fracture fragment and you can get a, a quad injury so the way we we tackled is uh, 
was like a, a kind of a neglected C1C2 facet dislocation. So we use this rod to our advantage, and finally we could get with a reduction. So this is the uh, the post-operative uh, uh, the X-ray that we uh, uh, got after getting a close uh, uh, reduction from the posterior side. We routinely use partial threaded screw to avoid irritation of the C2 ganglion. This is the C2 uh, pedicle screw, which we uh, could get into the both side. And we did a C1-C2 fusion from the all posterior side. This is the, the CT scan of the patient, uh, where you can see that the, the posterior fusion being performed, uh, the, uh, the realignment of the odontoid uh, to the, uh, the vertebral body. And this is uh, the patient. This is almost like a four-year uh, down follow-up now. Uh, Again, he has uh, a good flexion and extension, and uh, uh, obviously there'll be a restriction because we are doing a, a, a C1 C2 fusion in the terms of rotation. And uh, regarding the reduction manual, so when there is a failed anterior close reduction attempt, uh, one of the uh, uh, paper uh, which has mentioned only one report in the literature where they're going to transoral or transpharyngeal, and they try to take a C1 arch with the cockers. Uh, re reduce it back to the position. The problem is the overlap between the C1-C2 odontoid. When it becomes delayed and they present late and uh, it becomes very difficult to reduce it. They did a, uh, with the cockers when transoral took the C1, pulled it back, then did a odontoid and then did a posterior fusion. But what is the most important and take home message for this particular presentation is this particular paper. And there's a literature is pretty clear that there are a lot of respiratory arrest if you give an untoward traction. These patients can have a very well outcome uh, because as I said, the C1-C2, the space is quite roomy. You reduce, you fix. The C1-C2 fusion works fantastically well. So uh, one has to be very careful while giving a traction in these kind of a cases. And once you get a reduction, uh, uh, the outcome can be better. Thank you for your patient listening. Very good case. Yeah, uh, very good case. Yeah. Tushar, how how what, how you utilize the rod for reduction? I haven't uh, got that. So you have utilized traction, then you have put a pen field inside the facet, and third thing you have talked about the rod. I haven't got the rod manual. So, so the, the 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 problem for that that we were uh, basically maneuvering the C1 vertebra to get a reduction of a C1 versus C2. So the we wanted to give a posterior anterior force first with a traction. Uh, which was a risk because uh, in uh, anesthesia, we don't know how much is the traction. So we did a control traction and we wanted a rod. We were pushing the rod slightly front. At the same time, my pain field was between the C1, C2 to liver arm. And the, the rod was essentially used to push the C1 lateral mass anteriorly to get a reduction over the C2 remaining part of the vertebral body. Okay. okay. Great case, Dr. Tushar. Uh, very interesting to see the CM images. Do you have them? Uh, unfortunately, because I was almost uh, expecting this to like half uh, self reduce under anesthesia, but this is a very. It was. It was. Uh, believe me, it it really took a time, uh, and we were also concerned about the spinal cord. But uh, since the right side vertebral artery was uh, kind of rudimentary, I was very aggressive on the right side. I exposed both facet, and I could pass. I, I only C one C two facet capsule was already damaged, so I could pass my pain field between there, and then I reduced it gradually. Very innovative. Uh, Thank you. So excellent good, case, good, Tushar. Good. Uh, one, one, just one yes, question. Sir. Why do you think were you not able to reduce this case? Was it the muscle spasm or was it early healing? So I, I think two or three things. Uh, uh, first thing, this patient uh, presented uh, after a drunk injury, uh, uh, fall in a bathroom. The history was 10 day old. We asked repeatedly, but he was telling 10 day, which was, I think, is slightly troublesome after looking at the difficulty that we got in reduction. Second thing is I feel that when these patients keep moving here and then there's a settling collapse, which kind of initiates a fibrosis. I feel the most probable reason, as you rightly said, I could be that the duration that the patient gave history uh, might be slightly more than the 10 days they are giving. Toshar, which kind of tongs were you using? Gardner well or Mayfield? Sir, we use Gardner wells. Okay. Uh, Toshar, uh, did you use neuromonitoring during this uh, procedure? Yeah, we have we, we, we have used a neuromonitoring now. It's in-house uh, at KM Hospital, so we routinely use neuromonitoring for all. Uh, when you uh, also said that uh, the vertebral artery on the right side was uh, uh, inconsequential and so you use the right side, uh, I, do, is it necessary even with a normal vertebral artery, you can still use the, uh, the C1, C2 uh, facet or the interspace area to jack it up? Yes, uh, so, right. yes, we can use routinely also, but the, the, the question is that since it has a posterior displacement significantly, uh, you get a kind of a settlement between the C1, C2, the space becomes quietly uh, less to approach between that area. 
and uh, when you can easily uh, uh, approach that area i i went quite far i mean i i, I took a kind of a lateral approach of that side and went to the side as well to get a reduction but yes so finally, you can how much bleeding did you uh, get in this case how much bleeding were you uh, bleeding i did, did you not encounter 700 to 400 not significant bleeding. Uh, sir, yeah, I think uh, uh, we are running short of time. We should proceed to the next. I think. Thank you. Thank you for your. We shall stay with us, please. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So uh, the next speaker is, uh, with due respect, it is me. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, uh, coincidentally, I'm presenting a case which is uh, very much uh, similar to Dr. Junaid, uh, with some little difference. Uh, uh, let's uh, uh, have a look. Uh, uh, the patient, a uh, couple of days ago, we have recently done this case. Uh, the patient name is Mr. Abdul Goni, a 47-year-old motor vehicle driver from Mamishin. He was admitted in our hospital on uh, 8th January of this year. Uh, he sustained admitted in our hospital with a complaint of uh, pain in the neck following a road traffic accident for uh, 22 days back uh, with uh, weakness and difficulty of moving both upper and lower limb for the same duration. The patient was initially, the pain was initially localized uh, and it was continuous and dull lacking in nature which is aggravated by movement relieved by uh, some uh, rest and medication. The gradually the pain became diffuse in nature, which is spread up to the upper back and arms on both sides. The weakness and numbness were progressive and affected more the both upper limbs than that of the lower limbs. Uh, he had no bowel and bladder involvement, had no history of fever, cough or hemoptysis in contact with any tuberculous patient. He is non-diabetic, non-hypertensive, non-alcoholic, but he is a smoker. The past medical history revealed no significant illness. He lives in a so low socioeconomic status. Uh, regarding the examination findings, there was uh, spasticity on both uh, the upper and lower limbs. The biceps, triceps, and brachial jacks were exaggerated. Knee and ankle jacks were exaggerated on both sides. Patella and ankle clonus was present. Babinitskis and positive on both sides. And Hoffman sign was positive. And further neurological exam, uh, the motor deficit uh, was more severe in both upper limbs than that of the lower limbs. Uh, all the key muscle groups were uh, two to uh, three motor score was. So uh, with this clinical picture, uh, the learned audience, uh, what is in your mind that what might be the uh, probable provisional diagnosis of this case before proceeding to the further investigation? May I ask the learned audience? Actually, uh, the clinical scenario to go by the neurological level. Okay. In, yeah. yeah. So here uh, you have mentioned that, uh, you know, the shoulder uh, was involved or it was not, I think it was involved. Yeah. And it was involved. So I think uh, that should be the level of uh, injury. There may be concomitant injury lower down also, but what is more important for uh, a spine surgeon to know the proximal level? Okay. Yeah. So first we went for the radiograph. Uh, this is the radiograph. Uh, what we see, there is actually no sign of fracture or dislocation over there. Uh, so, uh, so the to uh, ascertain the uh, any fracture or dislocation, we asked for CT, but the patient was very much poor that he could not do the any further investigation, and with the uh, some help from the social welfare, we uh, had done only the MRI of for this patient. Uh, in the MRI, what we see there is a uh, in the T two weighted image there is a diffuse. Uh, called edema, uh, more affecting the uh, L45, uh, cervical 4-5 level with some extension in the proximal and proximally up to three and distally up to the six to seven level. But 
The spine, cervical spine seems to be slightly stenotic with a significant reduction in the anterior posterior diameter of the, as well as some degenerative changes in the uh, three to seven uh, cervical disc levels. But uh, no hyper intense uh, CT seen in the posterior ligamentous complex as well as the anterior longitudinal ligament. So uh, respected uh, faculties uh, with this uh, clinical radiological uh, scenario, uh, what uh, should be our next plan to do for managing the patient? Yeah, so actually in such situation now he is a driver. So this profession itself exposes the cervical spine to early degenerative changes. They develop cervical spondylosis very early because of the repeated acceleration and deceleration of the free cervical spine movement. That is one. The second, I think in X-ray also, uh, in one of the view, plain X-ray, I could notice the alignment at the facetal area was a little different. They may, that may be also because of the obliquity of the X-ray. So I was not pretty sure about that. In Yeah, so here, if you see here at uh, C3, the both the side facets are visible. Are you able to make it? Lower yes, down below, uh, below C3, you are able to see nice facet alignment. But at the level of the C3, both the side facets are visible. So I don't know whether it is because of the rotation element or it is having some, some clue here. Okay. So uh, that is one thing uh, which is uh, actually uh, visible. And even if you see the interspinous uh, space, this appears to be a little different. But this, this has to be actually checked in a proper view of the uh, MRI. And also, one should see the lateral cut of the CT. So I think uh, that uh, can give some clue. And naturally, this patient has, again, cord injury. There are signal changes in the cord. And uh, I think that may be the cause of his neurological deficit. Signal changes in the cord does not you know, dictate the amount of neurological deficit. It may be a minor deficit. It may be a quadriplegia. OK? So, so it just tells you that there is an injury to the uh, you know, cord. What is the amount of resultant deficit? It might vary. So, sir, uh, uh, would you go for surgery of this uh, case? Now, see, or I will have go to for study the axial cuts because yes. no, in this case, yeah. one has to see the axial cut also and see yeah. the uh, compression. Now, this patient is having incomplete injury. It is not yes, a complete sir. injury. Yes, sir. So here, the uh, chances of recovery are higher. Okay. So I think at the level of the compression, now all these, if you see this uh, axial cut, there is a significant uh, compression of the spinal cord. And we yeah. usually in, you know, cases of myelopathy, such type of picture can be there. And we say it is a banana sign for the spinal cord. Okay. In such situation, we also see in CT whether patient has any uh, ossified posterior longitudinal ligament. So that is another entity usually we try to rule out, okay? Because it makes a lot of difference even in the approach, whether it is a localized or it is a generalized. So I think you have uh, done all these things, but uh, one has to have a very close look and decide. The good thing about this case is this patient has an incomplete injury and the chances of recovery is high. So you should try to create the environment for the spinal cord and nerve roots. So there is a role of decompression here. Yes, thank you, sir. So what is your opinion whether we should go for anterior or posterior? Dr. Provost. Yes, sir. Please listen to me. Yes, sir. The cord compression as well as the root compression more on the left side, I think. Yes, sir. There are some sensory deficit in the at C5 and C6 level. But, yes. Uh, very mild. Yes. Yeah. So C3, C4, and C4, C5, and C5, C6. Whole through there is a cord compression as well as the root compression more on the left side. Yes. So definitely my decision is go through the anterior side after seeing the CT scan. If there is OPLL and there is a cathodic deformity at the surface spine, so I go for from the anterior side. This is my decision. Thank you, sir. For uh, any other opinion, please. From the learned audience, actually, in this yeah. case, whenever you have long segment compression, 
whenever you have a long segment compression three or more than three the posterior approach is definitely better it has two advantages one that there is already existing kyphosis in this case so you would be able to create the lordosis and you have a long segment compression so you decompress posteriorly in some of the situation what i have done where if there is associated one or two level anterior compression which is significant first do posterior decompression then you watch the patient many a time they improve significantly if there is some problem which is you know existing in the hand that respective area you can go later on anteriorly and decompress so long segment compression in cervical spine the posterior approach is advisable thank you sir dr okay. Sh can, can dr. i say sir. something about this case yes sir yes sir yes it is the last so, one yeah yeah i mean uh, the whole clinical presentation sounds more like central cord syndrome yes sir you said that upper extremity involvement is more than lower mm. extremity it looks like a stable spine degenerative spine with a signal change now we all know central cord syndrome like sir said they are partial spinal cord syndromes they recover so there is a controversy here just because there is a spinal cord injury signal uh for these it's not necessary that you have to jump in for surgery at presentation many of these patients will make a recovery and uh, it it is perfectly okay to watch these patients for neurological recovery for at least one one month to one and a half months and if they plateau off or if they don't show significant recovery you can go in and operate there are pros and cons of early decompression as well especially the cons because you know you have a cord swelling there and you are you are doing a, a early decompression it doesn't necessarily mean that it is the right thing to do in an acutely injured spinal cord so there are pluses and minuses of both early decompression and late decompression it's actually a raging controversy you know some people yeah. favor early some people favor late but i just want to say uh, that Pravish. there is an option of doing a later decompression for this rather than doing an acute surgery yes yes sir proish please proceed with the case no please yes yes uh this is actually a pre operative video i think uh, it is not that much necessary now uh so the diagnosis our clinical diagnosis was uh, the 20 days uh, two days old post traumatic cervical central cord syndrome of a 40 year old male uh this is the actually the treatment algorithm what we follow in these cases so our plan was uh go for posterior decompression by laminectomy and stabilization by lateral screw and rods then what we had done uh we went uh, through posterior approach we first uh put the lateral screws and that decompressed from c3 to uh, c6 level and this is the power operative radiograph uh and this is the post operative uh, radiograph and uh, i would like to show the post operative uh, video to you uh, there is a significant uh, recovery of the uh, uh, neurological a uh, condition this is the immediate video okay so what was the neurology you can tell uh, if you are not able to play yes sir you can tell the neurology the video is not you are not able to play the video yeah neurology was actually uh, initially it was only 2 by 5 in the upper limbs most of the uh, yeah. um uh, in the key muscle groups uh, but uh, in the later it becomes i think at least one great improvement in the in this okay. uh, in this case yeah great great please move ahead so next yeah yeah next slide so the take home messages the central cord syndrome needs to be uh, paid to special attention because uh, it is early surgery is rewarding in my in my consideration and sometimes late surgery may be may not end up with a successful outcome and thank you very much we did this case with very limited armamentarium in our institution but means uh, we don't have that much highly technological support 
uh, neuro monitor or any other things. Uh, and thank you very much for uh, uh, patience uh, hearing. Uh, thank, thank you, you Pravesh. The, that was an excellent case. So I will uh, request to I will request to the next uh, speaker, Dr. Manish Kothari, uh, to uh, to present his case. Dr. Manish is a senior yeah. spine consultant in uh, Jaslo Hospital. Thank you, Dr. Dheeraj. Doctor, thank you, Dr. Shiva Sir, Bangladesh Spine Society and Bombay Spine Society for this opportunity. Uh, Dr. Provesh, you need to stop uh, sharing so I can share. Yes. Yes. Uh, is it okay now? Yeah, um, I hope everybody can see my images. Uh, so that's my slide. I'm, uh, it's visible, right? So I'll quickly start yes, with sir. the history. This is a 42-year-old male, history of fall from bike. He was a pillion rider. He was admitted to a local hospital with weakness in both upper limbs and lower limbs. It was partial weakness. Uh, uh, he was diagnosed with injuries in the neck and, and an undisplaced lumbar spine fracture also. Uh, he presented with retention of urine during the first admission and he had to be catheterized. He was given steroids locally. You can see the power chart on the right. Uh, and because of his neurology and the cervical spine injuries, I'll show the x-rays later. He was given traction in the ward, awake traction, but uh, it was immediately stopped because he started uh, complaining of paresthesias. And uh, he was kept there for further conservative management for eight days. And he noticed that his left upper limb and lower limb was becoming weaker, and which is why they uh, sought a transfer uh, to Mumbai, that is my city. And uh, when he came to me uh, during the casualty, there was a severe neck and uh, right hip pain, right hip pain on movement. He had uh, active paresthesias in the left upper limb. Uh, he had some uh, very grade two pressure shows on the buttocks. And uh, but the catheter tug sensation, this is like a surrogate marker for uh, whether the bowel bladder is involved or not. So the tug sensations were intact. So you can see the power chart here. On the right side is more or less okay, but the C8 T1 is uh, zero. And the left side, he also had a humerus fracture. So uh, C5 could not be assessed. And the lower down uh, was uh, as charted. So coming to the x-rays, uh, this was uh, the cervical spine x-ray. The hip x-ray, we had pain. And the left shoulder uh, had a shaft commutated uh, fracture. So I'll quickly point out the injuries. So one is a C2 displaced fracture, posteriorly displaced. And there is a C4-5 hyperextension. There's no clear fracture, but we see it on CT scan and MRI. Uh, on the lumbar spine, uh, there was nothing uh, uh, clearly seen on the X-rays, nothing on the hip. So uh, this was CT, which was done already there. You can see there's a type 2 odontite, but uh, which is majorly displaced. Uh, almost the anterior cortex is meeting the posterior cortex here. Uh, at the C4-5 level, uh, there is uh, some retrolysis, hyperextension, but you can see there is some uh, pseudo-arthrosis kind of uh, situation going on. So we don't know whether this is fresh or old. Uh, same on the coronal views and the axial views. And that's the MRI. So MRI shows a C2 fracture as we already know, but there's a clear disc signal. This is what we were talking about initially. There can be traumatic disc ruptures also. Uh, so this may have been a mobile segment in otherwise fused uh, spine, but there was a, a disc signal suggesting this is probably a, a rupture of that segment. And there is an active cord compression going on also. But clinically, uh, neurologically, it points to the odontoid uh, because you can see there's a cord signal there. I don't know if it can, it can be appreciated on the screen, but there was cord signal at C2 as well as uh, C4, 5. And there's some ligamentum flavum infolding, if you have noticed there. So uh, this and this is the lumbar spine uh, image. So there you can see there's an oblique fracture going from left upper uh, left up uh, up and lateral corner going all the way to the right lower down corner. It's undisplaced, but there is also a, a epidural hematoma uh, surrounding from almost from N2 to S1. So these are the imaging. So we got a CT scan done. So the hip pain we realized was coming from the fracture. There was nothing in the hip per se. So three column transaction of the spine going all across cutting the uh, facets. So obviously this was a neglected or a missed ankylosing spondylitis case. You can see the SI joints are fused on both sides. And uh, so this is the working summary. It's a 43 year old male, previously undiagnosed angst bamboo spine, type 2 odontoid, but highly displaced. 
uh, C45 query hyper extension injury mostly. So it is difficult to ascertain. There's a lumbar epidural hematoma. We don't know his pre existing sagittal deformity. And there's a recent worsening on traction. So, on, sir, uh, question to Shivasa, sir. How do we proceed now, sir? In this case, actually, one of the transverse uh, cut you have uh, shown, Dr. Manish, where oh. there is a left side compression, if I'm not wrong, I think that might be the cause of ER. Yeah. So, in one of the, see here, in transverse cut, there is, I think, the disc might have, uh, you know, uh, gone. There may be some something here. Okay. So here, actually, encouraging spondylitis, you always prefer to fix from behind. Okay. Long segment fixation is required because this is a very unstable situation. So positioning is also important. And if you have a neuro monitor, nothing like that. And I think that positioning awake, initially, you do the awake positioning. And uh, you see uh, how you are able to get it. This the dense is fractured and it has gone behind. So similarly, the, as we discussed in previous case, but the previous case, it was not a case of encouraging spondylitis. This is actually uh, encouraging spondylitis and it behaves totally differently. You cannot have a single level fixation in such situation because the lever arm is very high in such situation. So here, I think uh, with the due care, one can try to align the spine and one has to do the decompression and fixation. Okay. So uh, first, so first I again, try, uh, yeah, awake, uh, you know, alignment. Now, since you mentioned that this patient was put on traction and he, he started deteriorating. Worsening, so, paracetamol. Uh, whether it was at higher level, at the dense level, or it was the lower discal injury, which is had some problem. And in axial cut, you have, I think, purposely shown that there is a compression on the left side. The right side root is looking all right. Left side root is compressed. So I think you are the best one to proceed with this case because you know from the beginning to the end what has happened to the patient. So I'll quickly main, go ahead. Main thing is that under... Yeah, please, please go ahead. So first, my concern was he had active paresthesias when I had first seen him. Uh, so, and I didn't want to put him on traction. So I just uh, supported his head and neck, put him in slight flexion. You can see I put sandbags on both sides, pillows under the neck. Uh, this was a pre-op X-ray that I, pre-admission uh, X-ray that was done at the primary hospital. And I tried to reduce it as much uh, bedside only. It's a shoot through lateral on a bedside uh, X-ray. So I've reduced uh, the C45 lordosis a bit. The dense is not yet reducing, but I couldn't do much uh, with it uh, without traction. Uh, but his paresthesias had reduced. So I was a little more comfortable at that point of time. I had, that gave me enough time to plan my surgery. Uh, right. So these are the thing the lordosis I reduced. So then I went, I, I went for uh, anterior in this case. I went, uh, my planning was to go with a long uh, plate. This is how we had to position the patient because he was fused entire bamboo spine. So we had to bend the uh, uh, bed according to the shape of his spine and give him some neck support. We went for an awake uh, nasal intubation. Uh, this is the uh, shifting on the table. In these patients, shifting is one of the most important steps. You have to shift. You can see the number of people involved in shifting. There are three on one side, four on one side, and I have taken the head. My hands are on the uh, trapezius and the shoulder and the clavicle. And my forearm is gripping the head. So this is an absolute important uh, necessary step. Uh, and continuously we're asking the patient to move his hands and legs to give us some indication uh, if it is a safe positioning or not. Uh, once he has been shifted, you see that I have not yet left the head of the patient. He's still under my hands. And uh, my assistant is trying to give me support. I said, no, I'm not positioning till I find a good position. This is a, a live neuro monitoring till I find a good position before I fix him. So you can see that I'm adjusting his uh, neck under uh, CM, so lateral CM uh, with me. And I'm asking to move uh, his leg so that I find a position where uh, the neurology is as I had seen him earlier. As soon as I give him some extension, he's complaining that his paresthesias have started in the left upper limb and lower limb. So I had to re uh, kind of, you know, uh, reduce the lordosis, keep it in a straighter position and uh, 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 you know, kind of get a position of comfort. So this is a position that I got. Finally, I put him on a, a, a radial lucid Mayfield clamp. And this is the position now, sir. So I, I have determined to go anterior rather than posterior. Uh, my next concerns are, is odontoid screw going to be possible? The trajectory is going to be very difficult. 
So uh, I did a small, uh, you know, just uh, they can see that the rod is there outside in my hand and I'm trying to align it in the direction of the odontoid screw. Uh, there. So I have still, there's some possibility that screw might be possible, but the screw is not fully, uh, the odontoid is not fully reduced. To put an odontoid screw, you have to have pre uh, uh, drilling uh, reduction, which I don't still have, but whatever adjustment I was doing, uh, it was giving paresthesias to the patient. So I had to accept this position. So I thought, okay, let's do with the uh, cervical plating first and then we'll discuss uh, about the odontoid. So this was, I obviously did this under neuromonitoring, but it wasn't of much help. Baseline neuromonitoring only SSCP on the right was positive, left was absent. I had only right biceps, MEPs, all other MEPs were absent. So I had the neuromonitoring was of not of much help, but I had to go ahead. There was no stopping here. So I went ahead, did a, a long plate uh, two above, two below, and then tricortical iliac crafts graft. I was very happy with the purchase of the screws, and I thought this should be sufficient uh, for the C45 segment. Uh, but I was unhappy that uh, the lordosis is completely gone, but that was a position I had to accept. <clears throat> now, there are some questions is that, uh, uh, as I said, lordosis is very less. Uh, will I be able to do odontoid or not? And I don't know the preoperative global seattle balance. So that was also on the back of my mind, although it was not my priority. So uh, uh, as in, that was the MRI. So I can't give him any more lordosis. I thought, should I remove the plate, give it a lordotic bend and do it again? But uh, without the neuromonitoring uh, 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 support, because there was no MEPs in the lower limb, I was not very comfortable uh, doing that. So I was prepared to do anterior odontoid, even if I don't get reduction. Uh, uh, question to Dr. Shitesh, if he's around, Dr. Dhira, Dr. Satyan. Uh, if the trajectory is now not favorable because of that awkward position, uh, what would be your choice? Would you go for odontoid screw or uh, uh, do something else or flip him over and do uh, posterior? So the biomechanics in this is totally not favorable for an anterior standalone reconstruction. So in my book, uh, this patient, all the the fracture, I mean, in a bamboo spine, everything, all the stresses are going to come at the fracture side. So anterior buttress plating, I mean, it's okay to do it as a, like an initial thing for you to flip over. But whatever I do from the front is going to be locked in from the back. So, but now about the odontoid. Dr. Manish. Dr. Manish. I'd like to say in case of the angspun and the uh, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis cases, any kinds of trauma uh, should be addressed from the posterior side because anterior fixation is very tough, uh, tough and tougher to be reduced and to be handled to, uh, carefully. Yeah, but uh, somehow I was able to do that. I agree with you, posterior is good, but the dynamics in this patient was such that I had to go anterior and we stuck to that plan. So and uh, it's okay to do anterior as long as it's locked in from behind. That would make me comfortable. Yeah. But the, because because the financial... odontoid screw in this kind of a situation with a fused segment, so the biomechanics so are not in your favor. So here. C23 oh. is mobile. C12 is mobile. And OC2 is mobile. If everything is below C4 is fused. Yeah, but still that's... I mean... <laughs> yeah, but but it's like going to be... Uh, how about the usual indication that's uh, for sure this, this whatever you have done it is very good because if patient has neurology and every time you are extending the higher up patient is developing problem it is better to fix the spine in deformed position because neurology is more important later on you can go for deformity correction so don't feel bad that you could not give laudosis this was not required agreed, at that agreed. Perfect, yeah, perfect. It's not a concern at all. I mean, I would say I would say the opposite. If you try to get lordosis here, you will be in big trouble afterwards. You'll be fixing him all the way looking up upwards. Yeah. You better fix them in kyphosis. That's what their natural position is. Manish is what? Anterior C1, C2 fusion is another choice. You can put uh, trans article screws. Yeah. You know. So that was what I was prepared to do with. That if not, I don't get the trajectory, I can do a C1. It's a different case. It's not this case. It's a different case that I've done previously. Uh, I was prepared for that. So I went ahead. I did an odontoid uh, uh, in this. So again, it is not against conventional, but I thought I'll get away with it. 
the fortunately the trajectory was good and i wanted to say moments uh, two uh, two cm uh, uh, were ready uh, we did anterior the angle of working was very difficult i had to really uh, bend down and work that is a drill that is almost parallel to the chest uh, the c2 was not fully reduced uh, there was some step so i used my finger as you can see to push the body of c2 down and get reduction and then pass uh, the screw so that was the screw that was the final construct of uh, uh, the cervical spine uh, i had planned for a posterior cervical but finances were uh, a major uh, uh, concern uh, he underwent a, a humorous nailing also in the same sitting uh, now next was two days later was the stage 2 lumbar spine also needed to be addressed uh, so he was uh, positioned prone i the aim of the surgery was a solid three column fixation also to probably if i can take care of the uh, uh, the loss of cervical lordosis in some out but uh, i did not have neuro monitoring as previously he had no mmps in the lower limb and it's already a lordotic spine so i have add further lordosis to this is going to be difficult so this was the surgery i did uh, this was a l1 to s1 fixation uh, i was able to do a wide facetectomy at l4 and l5 give it some more lordosis and uh, reduced uh, decompressed the l2 to s1 segment evacuated the hematoma i don't know it was compressive or not but because there was uh, uh, not much clinical uh, to determine us so decompressed and uh, give it some upper degrees of 9 degrees of lordosis and uh, because it was an l4 i it, i, I hope it give him give him some correction and this was a final uh, this is a 3 month follow up currently so we are watching the cervical spine as we said posterior but as i said finances was a major concern and uh, so far is doing well we are watching him is on collar as well and we'll take so a how, how many months for follow up this is 3 3 is just 3 months not a long follow up oh, okay. so okay. how did you okay. mobilize how soon did you mobilize is it like immediate uh, uh, as in he didn't have much we got him sitting uh, from uh, day 3 day 3 so of lumbar spine yeah. so immediate basically immediate yeah, yeah you're not that, waiting that's risky actually so i, because, I think uh, it's uh, these patients are osteoporotic and uh, it's uh, with just with odontoid screw i think it was so was it osteoporotic was it osteoporotic so it wasn't i got a very good hold i got a very good and i could take a hold i could get a thread in the posterior cortex of odontoid also so yeah. okay, i was i was very good. confident Did you, uh, Manish? Great case. Did you consider doing a uh, second screw into the odontoid? I mean, did you have enough space? There was space no or? space. There was no space, sir. I thought yeah. about it, but there was there's a large four mm screw. There was no space. Uh, no great case. I mean, very well done. Excellent, very excellent well. work, sir. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Please, this fracture has uh, been to good alignment of sagittal L spine. Okay. So I think this fracture has led to a deformity correction also. Partly, sir. Just nine <laughs> degrees. Not much. Yeah. Uh, Pravesh, we'll uh, let's call the next speaker. Superb. Uh, thank you, sir, for yes. presenting a very excellent uh, case. Now, I would like to request uh, uh, our Secretary General of uh, Bangladesh Spine Society, Professor Dr. Mohammad Anwar Islam, to uh, present his case. Thank you, Pavas, and thanks to Bangladesh Spine Society as well as Bombay Spine Society, especially Dr. Dhiraj and Pravas. those who are working very hard uh, during uh, making this presentation and this uh, international cme dr shivas president bangladesh uh, bombay spine society and professor kondokar abdul rizvi president bangladesh spine society and secretary general of bombay spine society dr shakten uh, congratulations and thank you all for giving me the opportunity to be present this two very simple cases but need to be very meticulous decision from the learned audience uh, can you see a screen dr prabhas yes yes sir is coming sir yes coming sir okay so it's in progress what we can't see the screen yet uh still not visible so it is a difficult so is there a network issue 
I think I think there is a network issue. So switch off your video, sir. Uh, I think, sir, you should uh, screen out, then uh, uh, try again, sir. Sir, can you hear me, sir? Is professor with us right now? Just check now. Anwar, sir, can you hear me? Uh, Prabhash, Anwar yes, is sir. disconnected probably. Can you make yes, a sir. phone call? Uh, yes, If sir, he I'm takes longer this. time, then I think we can skip him. Yeah, we can conclude then, sir. We can yeah. wait for a few minutes, then we can conclude. Yes. We already passed the time. Sir. Yeah, yeah. Can you call him, uh, your Prabhash? Yes, sir. I'm calling, sir. Okay. Okay. So, in the meantime, can I ask Manish a question? Yes, yes, sure, sir. Please, sir, carry on. Manish, I may, I may have missed it. What was your apprehension of turning him? Was so it as, like neurology? Yeah, so neurology, not, I, as I said, not he had, when he came to me, he had active paresthesias. Even the slightest of movement at the neck caused a lot of uh, paresthesias. He had okay. lost, uh, he had lost significant power after the traction at the previous hospital, hmm. and I was trying to kind of get a movement of position, uh, comfort uh, under Siam in the OT awake. And just a little bit of movement was causing a lot of uh, paresthesia. So that was making me apprehensive to turn the patient. We were ready with anterior and posterior both. Uh, yeah. But I thought it was safer to kind of fix him with the uh, anterior first and give him an option of posterior later on. Mm -hmm. But finances were such I mean, a private setup. So that was... Concerned. I understand. So what, the, the way I have done this in the past is I have, uh, I have put them in a halo and turned them awake so you can fix them in that position I mean, obviously all this will require money and effort so that yeah. is uh, all those things but in a halo you can fix them and you can connect the halo to your table so you don't have to like remove all yeah. those things you connect halo vest in that position fix him it's an awake intubation yeah. it's an awake prone positioning so after prone positioning also the patient is still awake he's not induced Make the patient move their legs and then ask the uh, anesthetist to give anesthesia. Remove your posterior rods and do all of them together. So that's one way of doing yeah, that's it. That's one way of because doing it. Uh, because you are doing all this awake, uh, you, have, you don't need neuromonitoring. You have the patient cooperative enough to tell you, okay, hath hila ke dekhao, pair hila ke dekhao, that sort of thing. So, but, but this is perfectly a good way of doing it. Uh, was, uh, I mean, it, it's the surgeon's feeling, right? You got to feel that, okay, this will survive because your purchase was good. Purchase was fantastic. And this patient was a time. relatively young person, but, you know, trying to do this in a middle-aged person with angst for several years is going to be hard. Absolutely. So it's not Older like, a, it's not something that is conventional, I would say. You still would try to get a posterior. That's true. Oh, so far, nice. he's, good. he's improved very well neurologically. Yeah. So I'm just kind of watching. I think he will survive. So, I mean, yeah. so far, 
they will fuse quite quickly. Anurag is connected, connected now, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, he has shared the screen. Dr. Dr. Prabhas, can you share? Yes, yes, sir. I can see your screen, sir. Sir, please go to slide view, sir. No. Okay. Now, can you see? Can you see? Yes, Dr. sir. Prabhas? Yes, sir. Can okay, you see, sir. see me? Sir, we can see, sir. sir we can see. Yes, sir. Yes, you go ahead. Okay, sir. thank you. Sorry for the uh, computer inconvenience and uh, uh, due to the uh, connection, faulty connection of internet, uh, I am uh, losing your many times. Uh, sorry for that. The case number one is a very uh, simple case, but it needs to be a decision from the learned audience. Mr. Miraj, a 25 years old daily laborer attending in the emergency department of my hospital with the history of fall on slippery ground while bearing heavy object over his head. He was unable to move his both lower limbs, but his sensory was intact. On neurological assessment, it was Asia grade B. It was Asia grade B injury, and you just see the X-ray. This is the X-ray cervical spine FEVU. This is FEVU, and this is the level view of the cervical spine. After seeing that X-ray, I'd like to ask the audience, what can be the, what can we do next? Mm -hmm. What the investigation is necessary to uh, confirm that diagnosis of this case? Dear audience, Audience, please. I think you should go ahead and do the MRI because in okay, this case, to the significant, uh, you know, change in the disc space, so he might be having discal injury also, apart from the facet injury. And moreover, he is having neurological deficit, so it is better to, uh, you know, is, you know, image his uh, uh, can. Okay, thank you, sir. You just see the MRI. Summary of the cervical spine is sedative view. You just see how much and the compression over there at the C5 disc over the cord. You just see. And this is the HGL MRI of the section at C5 6 And it is, this is the MRI myelogram. You just see. Just like a cord section. Dear audience. He has slick score of nine. What will be the management plan next? What is in your mind? Can you go back to the images? Okay. This is the MRI of cervical spine, cervical, axial section, and MR myelogram. And the CT? Uh, I did not uh, do any CT. Because uh, the patient cannot afford the two uh, investigation like CT and MRI. So, as there is a chance to be uh, neural compromisation, so I, I was in favor of MRI. So, I mean, I would like to take a closer look at those facet joints, uh, how they are. Like, is it a facet fracture? Is it a jump facet? What kind of configuration is there at the back? Do you have any images of that on the MRI? Can you can you place the plane? Yeah. Okay. So maybe there is not. So let's assume there is no nothing there. Yes. The lower yeah. end of this, uh, you know, the inferior, you are seeing one piece like thing. You know, maybe. this might be your concern actually. Okay. Or okay. maybe. But it is a bifacetal dislocation and uh, the discal thing is also actually worrisome. So I think it is a fresh injury, then I will go anterior, take out the disc and reduce from front only. And most of the time uh, you are able to get the reduction, you know, and then you okay. just do ACDF. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. You, to do the so you I should be careful that you only contour the plate. You should fix into extension. Because then only it will work. Because many a times, you know, you have to go here and have an additional fixation. But if the alignment is proper, okay, sir, I have to proceed. 
मल्टी स्टेज सर्जरी thing anterior posterior then again going anteriorly and fusing and also by the uh, professor basu uh, we, we recently uh, uh, presented uh, uh, eight cases of uh, bifacial dislocation presented with an on an average of 3 months uh, uh, delayed uh, presentation in that uh, we are instead of uh, doing all this multi stage procedure in a public setup we have we are been doing a single stage corpectomy of the lower body uh and uh, using a tricortical electrolyte graft and uh, fusing it uh, in situ okay thank you sir thank you sir i would like to i would like to proceed okay we admitted the patient in our spine unit and managed by application of contraction intravenous fluid and analgesic etc but unfortunately the patient did not relieve with the strong traction now with this history neurological involvement and x ray mri what would you like to do What surgery would you prefer? Many of you have told the double stage surgery, single stage surgery, perfectomy, SCBA, whatever may be. Just you see what we do. We try reduction through anterior approach, uh, but uh, fail to reduce, and there is a bifurcation of success. And we cannot reduce. Not less. In this situation, what should be your? What should we do? Then? I think only the recommend for reduction and. Okay, if anyone from the audience and panelists, sir, and, sir, uh, usually at on an average of six weeks, what we have found in our studies also, there is the ossification of the uncovertebral joints, as well as there is a facetal uh, capsule uh, buckling which uh, fuses usually. So the reduction uh, only with a disc and a soft tissue procedure is difficult. Thank you, thank you for your comment. Nice comment. Okay, I'd like to proceed again. We did the C6 perfectomy and fusion by mesh case and autogenous cancellous bone graft with stabilization by locking plate and screw. And this is the perforative uh, photograph as well as the perforative CRV maze. And this is a few months after. This is the postoperative X-rays after a few months uh, later. The patient is now neurologically uh, okay. Uh, with some limitations, the patient is now neurologically okay in Asia grade D and has returned to his activities with few limitations. Have you any comments regarding this from the audience? Is lucky fellow from B to go to D. Patient As is a lucky fellow to go from B to D. I said. <coughs> no, no. So it is. We also have found a, a good neurological recovery in our case. Yeah. No, that's what I am saying. Yeah. For a from a B to D, no. I mean, do you mean to say that this is because of the surgery or because of the cord injury? Whatever is the uh, intrinsic cord injury. I think we are just creating an environment for the cord to recover, and uh, yeah. I think surgery does play a role. Yeah. Probably. That's why I said it's lucky for two month old Asia B to become a Asia D. I wouldn't have expected it. Yeah, and my other question would be: Do they have residual? I mean, does he have residual? Uh, Sir, do you uh, have any video post of video? No, I have no video. This is the X-ray, but neurologically, as I assess after nine months of surgery, and the, that was the neurological improvement of the patient. Dear audience. Can you permit me? I'd like a very short case again. Another one. There are Can there you... are different views, and uh, so even if you are not able to reduce it, there is a way described that you go posterior. You might need to excise the facet, and you will be able to align it. Now, if the disc is lying inside the canal, there is no harm in going anterior, and be very sure that you are not going to create more deficit. 
you take out the disc, turn the patient and do facetectomy and align it. And many a time that suffices because after doing discectomy, if you just align the column, it auto fixes. Or if you wish to con confirm that no, my fusion has to be there proper, you can come and tear it and again fuse it. But the old dislocation where you are not able to reduce is the going posterior and doing facectomy is the described procedure and that can be done. In that case, you need not go for those so much long fixation. Now, I will advise you to watch this patient. If you see the post-operative uh, you know, picture, the plate, the extent of the plate is very long. It is bridging the upper disc. So, this patient might have problem. If you can just go to the post-operative x-ray. The, the plate could have been slightly shorter and uh, with a slightly upward directed screw. Yeah, it could have been. But uh, since patient has improved, I think uh, it has worked. Any other comments? No. Or I, I, so, uh, next case, please. Next case. Okay. Can I switch to the uh, other case? Sir, okay. Do you think uh, uh, it. So, Prabhash, the time is short. Go for next case. Attended in the. Just in segment D, sir. While traveling by bus and suffered from neck pain with radiation to the foot of time, please. And could not take grip with his left hand. This is the history of this patient. And motor deltoid was 4 by 5, that is shoulder abduction after 15 degrees. It was weak, and biceps was uh, 3 by 5 on the left side, that is end location. ECRB and ECRL power was 3 by 5, that is uh, wrist extension in left side. <laughs> Sensory was diminished, sensation of the thumb and index, left index and thumb, and reflexes diminished on the left side, biceps and brachial reflexes. With this presentation, initially managed by semi-rigid cervical corner and analgesic sedative, but pain did not suffer. This is the X ray, this is the X ray of this patient. Here, learned audience, please. Please, have you any comments regarding this x-rays? Yeah, there is a comment. This appears to be unifacetal dislocation. Yes. Because if you see the AP view of this patient, these spinous processes lower down are in different alignment with the upper one. So this is one of the one of the actually radiological feature which suggests this patient has a Unifacetal dislocation. Yes. Yeah. And usually this this uh, subluxation is not significant. Usually they are having grade one or maybe grade two. So I think the radiologically it appears that this patient has unifacetal dislocation. Here, if you also draw a line on the lateral view, this is spinal laminar line. If you go lower down, it is not aligned. So there is displacement here. Thank you, sir, for your for your nice comment. Actually, that this was the unilateral facet dislocation. So, what can we do next? We do an MRI, and that was the MRI feature. You just see that was the MRI feature. This is the subduction, and this is the. Show us the T2 images, sir. Uh -huh. Oh. So there is a compression. There is a compression on the left side. Level. Here, six score of six. With this clinical presentation, X-ray and MRI, how to treat this patient or treat this case? Conservative. Can you, can you, can you please yeah. the duration? Trauma, the duration, uh, what is the duration? The duration was only 15 days. The duration was only two weeks. It is 15 days. How many days? Two weeks, yeah. Two it weeks. is only 15 days. Two weeks. So, straightforward anterior surgery, anterior discectomy, and you can uh, maneuver, and it most of the time you are able to get the reduction. And then just ACDF. Any other comments from any other uh, uh, learned audience and panelists and say a person?
No, no, Sam. I do agree with it, Sudhir. Thank you, sir. We did a CDR with the case and stabilization by locking plate and screw. And that is the scenario of that. This is the paraparative uh, uh, photograph and the AP CRM image and lateral CRM image. So this is the post-operative x after a few months. The patient is neurologically now okay and he is returned to his uh, normal activities. As you are seeing, a sedentary occurs, so he is returned to his sedentary activities. Have you any comments regarding this? Sir, looks perfect, sir. Thank you. No, no comment. Okay. Thank you, everybody, Thank for giving me the time and opportunity to be present this to simple, very simple case. I'm taking uh, the plan of treatment from the learned audience. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, Pravesh, uh, you want to say something? Yeah, actually, uh, we are very uh, uh, near to the end of this session. It was an excellent one. I think everyone uh, was very much spontaneous and collaborative. <laughs> And uh, we enjoyed a lot. And especially, I'd like to give a lot of thanks to Dr. Dhiraj uh, for uh, a very long time. He was excellently organizing this session. And uh, I was just cooperating him regarding uh, arranging this seminar. That was crucial. Uh, thank you. And, uh, and now I would like to uh, request our honorable president of our society to say some few words uh, at the end point of this session. Uh, uh, thank you, Prabhash, and a special thanks to Diraz, and also my uh, special uh, thanks to SK Subhastava and other members of this Bombay Spine Society. In fact, uh, this was a, an excellent uh, uh, webinar uh, because uh, all the faculties they have presented so brilliantly and they have presented so difficult cases. Some of the cases I have not seen before and I was really afraid the way they handled those cases. This is say, impressive. I was thinking uh, uh, in Bangladesh, uh, we have shortage of so many uh, specialties, especially, you know, uh, these uh, difficult cases, uh, we have also difficult cases, but we hardly can manage them. And uh, you were a Bombay Spine Society is very fortunate. They have so, uh, so many uh, very uh, learned uh, faculties and surgeons and managing difficult cases. In fact, uh, this was a very important topic. I would like to thank the organizers to, for choosing the spine uh, injuries. You know, uh, in Bangladesh, we have a lot of spine, uh, cervical spine injuries. In fact, uh, we do not have any statistics, but uh, it would be a uh, few hundred thousand at least. And every year, a uh, few thousands are adding to. And uh, most of the cases remaining in neglected. And you know, these spinal surgeries are a personal tragedy. And not only personal tragedy, it is a family tragedy as well. And, uh, and this mortality rate is high also. And unfortunately, mortality rate and the morbidity and mortality is much more in our countries with spine condition. We cannot support them. Government does not support them because we have a shortage of resources. And uh, we have a severe shortage of facilities as well. The, the surgeries uh, we have shown uh, from your uh, uh, Bombay uh, is uh, hardly possible in our country because uh, we, have, we don't have neuro monitor in a uh, big institution as well. We need to improve our situation and uh, I'm very happy and I would like to thank this uh, our Indian counterpart for their help, for helping us uh, in upgrading our knowledge. Uh, uh, updating our knowledge. And I know some of our doctors are also going to India uh, to different uh, centers to uh, learn from them. So uh, keep uh, teaching us and keep uh, uh, train, uh, training our young doctors so that we can improve our situation here. Other important thing is that uh, this uh, 
treatment of uh, spinal injuries are very expensive, lengthy, frustrating. Uh, so, uh, and we know the reason for the spinal injuries. It is only three, four uh, major injuries are there. One is road traffic accident. Uh, other is fall, which is very common in our country. And uh, uh, other is uh, also is very common. Uh, that is, uh, we call it assault, violence. Violence is also uh, very rampant in our uh, countries. So if we could control all few things, then uh, probably we could reduce the number of cases. I think as a society, as a society, since uh, uh, not only our duty is not only to produce good surgeons, our also uh, responsibility is to prevent the spinal cord injuries. That is why I would like to request all our members uh, who there is this member of the Bangladesh Spine Society or Bombay Spine Society, we should uh, devote on more time to prevent these injuries. And it should be a movement. Uh, uh, this way, this movement is not very strong. I know Chabra has uh, some uh, uh, strong uh, presence say, in this movement for the prevention of the spinal cord injuries. But otherwise, uh, uh, in our society, I would like to uh, emphasis, uh, I would request my young doctors to uh, be very serious about this preventive program. With this uh, few words, thanking again, especially Subhastava and other senior faculties uh, uh, for your presence and for presenting so difficult, beautiful cases. Thank you. Good night. Uh, thank you, sir. That was uh, really encouraging words from you. Uh, I will love to do this program with you again, sir. It was a wonderful experience for us. Uh, I will uh, like, uh, ask uh, Professor Srivastava, sir, to conclude with the last few words. Uh, no, actually, Dheeraj, I would like our dynamic secretary, Dr. Satyan Mehta, to do yeah. this honor. Satyan, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Hello, Satyan. Letting me uh, speak. Uh, uh, I, first of all, uh, I want to thank uh, Bangladesh Spine Society. Uh, we've been in touch with them uh, since the last few months. Uh, we've had uh, programs in the past also, and uh, we would like to continue our partnership with uh, Bangladesh Spine Society so that uh, we can learn from you as well uh, as uh, uh, you are learning from us. We are also learning from you. Uh, so it is a mutual cooperation, sir. Uh, I want to thank all, your, all our faculty. Uh, I want to thank uh, our Bombay Spine Society faculty as well as Bangladesh Spine Society faculty uh, for uh, this uh, program. Uh, and uh, next time uh, we will have another good one after a few months, we'll start working on that and we'll have it more crisp and more time oriented next time. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks to all of you. Thank, thank you, Siraj. Thank you, Anwar. Thank you. I would also yeah. like to thank our Secretary General, uh, Professor Anwar. He is very keen in uh, organizing this webinar. Okay. Uh, I hope uh, uh, and believe since uh, we have shown your interest to continue this kind of programs, we'll be able to arrange uh, more programs in the coming days. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank I you. want to add one thing. The both the BASS, Bangladesh Spine Society and Bombay Spine Society, that everything has been discussed about the incomplete spinal cord injury. Nothing had been mentioned about the complete spine cord injury, which is the neglected part in our society. Already our president uh, said Dr. Chabra has uh, working on it. So we, we together can arrange a, a future program on this complete spinal cord. That's, that will be interesting, sir. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank you. Good night, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. Good night, everybody. Dr. Shivastha, sir. Thank you. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Sudhir. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, thank you, sir. Thanks.